Hello and welcome to Decomposing Worm, a worm analysis podcast. That's Clarence. He's the first-time reader and literary expert. And that was Matthias. He's read the story before. In this 12-episode series, we're using critical theory to explore the superhero web serial Worm from a high-level perspective, covering Worm in six 300,000-ish word chunks. Mm -hmm. And today is part two of book two, Perspectives. So here we're going to be applying literary theory to Worm, combing through um, arcs 9 through 14 with the lens of a couple of theorists. Um, Well, their theories, the theorist theories, and uh, we'll kind of go into how we're going to use them um, uh, as we as we kind of get into our topics. Mm -hmm. Uh, As usual, if you haven't read uh, up through arc 14 yet, please do. This is a also a full spoilers discussion. So um, this is our second perspective episode. I think we have a slightly better handle on what we're trying to do here. So hopefully uh, we won't stumble as much getting into it. Um, I was really pleased with how much people said that they did not like um, the the last one. So that was really neat. Um, Yeah, people were like very open to it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, (laughs) man, the, the, the theorists that I picked for this, it was... A lot. It's a lot harder than Marx. Oh gosh, <laughs> Marx is so easy comparison. Um, so uh, the order that we're going to be doing this is um, first we're going to do our character studies. Uh, I'm talking about uh, Labyrinth and a bit of Burn Scar, and Clarence is talking about uh, Cherish, Cherish and Region, or just Cherish. No, it's just Cherish, but like it's hard to talk about Cherish mm-hmm. without right. mentioning Region just a bit. Yeah, and uh, then we'll go into our, our theorist stuff. Um, Clarence, who are the people you're talking about? In the concepts? Um, I'm talking about uh, Althusser mainly um, and his concept of interpolation, um, of like the right. whole, I, you know, like recognition. And I guess you could tack on the idea, like I'm talking about materiality, but I don't really have a specific person to tie it to. Yeah, because that's kind of, it comes from, I think, a lot of people. Yeah. It's kind of, it's, I, I think we just couldn't figure out who specifically yeah, who it originates. Yeah, specifically to trace it to, because there's, it's just so broad, a concept. Yeah. And we'll go into what that is when yeah, we yeah. talk about it. Um, and then my section, uh, I wanted to talk about deconstruction. So uh, Derrida, um, he outlined that. And it's a little bit different from the pop culture understanding of the word. Um, it, just a little bit. It, it, the, the pop culture TV tropes definition of deconstruction is derivative of the Jacques Derrida's deconstruction method thing. Um, but it's really complicated. But to talk about it, I decided to talk about structuralism. And that's kind of be, as I wrote it, it kind of turned into just like a lecture. So we'll see how that goes. And if you guys are are too bored by how much I talk about not warm stuff, you guys let me know. But anyway, we'll we'll, we'll get to it when we get to it. Yeah, it, it's kind of like setting up, you know. Mm-hmm. It's like yeah, and then a... in between it all, it's going to be uh, little little bits and sections to liven things up. Mm-hmm. So hopefully, yay. Hopefully, yes. Also, full um, full disclosure, we we again we claimed this before, but this is like reinforcing. Yes. We are not we are not experts in literary analysis. We you know we're we're we are but students and kind of after students, you know, in that liminal space. But we're not fully formed, you know, professional literary experts, you know, who are like fancy and acclaimed and such. Mm-hmm. So you know, just take take it with that in mind. <laughs> Many grains of salt. I, yes. Ideally, it, you know, you get interested a whole in... whole tablespoon. Ideally, if you don't know what we're talking about and you are you get interested in it, go read The Theorist or go read someone else talking about The Theorist, which might be easier. Mm. Um, if you do know what we're talking about and we're talking about it wrong, um, then you can send us an email and explain it also, to us. Also, we are sorry. <laughs> also, we are sorry. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Um, all right, let's, let's get into it, right? Mm, um, here we go. So we're going to start off with talking about Labyrinth, um, also known as L. So uh, when I first did the Danny one, um, I realized the way I, I started going and I, I realized I didn't have a plan on how I was going to talk about it all. Mm-hmm. So um, I still don't really have a plan for this, but I wanted to structure it a little bit by just laying out the facts first before we start um, diving into what her character is saying. So. Mm-hmm. She's this young girl, right? Um, her power... She, she's rated a, a Shaker 12. Um, we see her uh, a, a couple times until her her interlude, but her interlude is the first mm-hmm. time we get actually like any insight beyond she's a girl who sometimes gets lost in her own worlds. 
Yeah, um, yeah. And even the times before we see her power, it's it's pretty hard to understand what's going on. Um, actually, there's a when she like, she she helps with the fight against Oni Lee, and there's the part where she starts raising these these pillars out of the ground, and um, then Taylor you know gets touched by her, and you know they all fall away, and then she's watching Oni Lee like stumble over something that's not there. Yeah, yeah. And I think the times that I've read it before. I had interpreted that as like he's dodging something that was in his like previous teleportation, like mm. something was about to hit his his clone, and then he teleported, and so like both clones that was left behind, and when he teleported, dodged the thing. But that's not what happened. He's actually dodging the the pillars and stuff that don't exist anymore. And there's another part where he like teleports to the top of a building and then falls 15 feet and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So. In retrospect, that makes a lot of sense. I don't know why I didn't notice it the first yeah, I three like times I, I read it. It was hard to kind of figure out quite at the beginning. I think because Taylor doesn't know what's going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. A lot of a lot of the time, it's kind of where we're kind of following her, where we mm-hmm. we don't know because she doesn't know. Yeah, yeah. So um, the the first time we really get to to know her is of course her interlude. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's really fascinating about this is uh, she doesn't actually show up in the narration until. Eight paragraphs in. Actually, the first, the first time we see any mention of her is the eighth paragraph, in which it's a line of her thoughts. But we don't mm-hmm. actually know who she hasn't been named yet, so we don't yeah, know yeah. that it belongs to her. We assume it actually is a thought belonging to uh, Spitfire because she's the first one mentioned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, she her name doesn't appear until the twelfth paragraph, and even then, um, no, not the twelfth, the fourteenth, and even then, it's. Just like a mentioning of her banging on the window, so yeah. from from her very first appearance, we see how like disconnected from reality she is. Um, that she doesn't even show up in her own story. Yeah, for so I long. think it's even like even more than reality is like her own identity of like mm-hmm. a self. Yeah, yeah. A lot of it, the, like the way that this thing starts off, is very out of body, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's a part where it describes how. Right now, it's a good day, right? So she uh, isn't in her other world so much. It's kind of... She, she describes it as having to look through, like, a spyglass, right? To see... To, to, to search the world, right? Mm-hmm. Rather than taking in the whole thing at once. And it kind of makes you wonder when she is in a bad place, maybe looking at reality is kind of like looking at the other end of spyglass as well. Which is not fun to think about. No, that sounds terrifying. Yes. Um, so I have two or three things I want to talk about here. Um, the, the first is how uh, fault, or Labyrinth is actually like a pretty good person. And there's a couple of places mm-hmm. where that comes in, into place. Um, I, I think it's really adorable that she like really sees them, uh, the rest of the Fault Lines crew as family. And that comes up a couple of times. She like really does care about these people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, and they take care of her. Um, I think that's, that's pretty sweet. Um, and we'll return to the idea of her being a good person in a second. The second is, of course, the nature of her power. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the third is her interaction with Burn Scar. But we can get to that in a second. So uh, her power is this... It, it, it's kind of really hard to understand, especially hard to explain without, like, in, without bringing in my influences of how I know the rest of the universe is constructed in Worm. Yeah. Um, but even then, it's it's still pretty hard to understand as you know the, the whole phased in reality thing right like with the fight against the merchants um taylor asks herself the question like is gregor like seeing everyone like float around and the answer is yes i think oh. um, so so me- she has like like physical impact like her her visions mm-hmm. and constructions yeah they're have not material they're not impact. just illusions mm-hmm. okay yeah, not, it, i don't think i realized that before i mean i probably yeah. like recognized it as as i was reading but i don't think i it didn't like register yeah, for, didn't for register. the future as knowledge yeah like in in her interlude burn scar is, is setting fires everywhere mm-hmm. and the way labyrinth you know fights back is she brings in this this statue that is filled with water and she what's so fascinating about it so she has to kind of cobble it together as it's coming out right so it's like yeah. it exists in this other world and yet she modifies it as it comes into this one and she has to modify it with something that already exists. And I just find it so fascinating that... So, so when she's searching for um, this, the, whatever the mechanism she needs to activate the statue, mm-hmm. uh, several ones come to mind, including one 
it says uh, the the portcullis no uh, the, the chain was too rusted uh, too prone to, to snapping which is like such such character tied to this thing that may or may not exist uh, yeah like Us. like how does she know it's too prone to snapping you know like i don't know it's mm. so she knows the the properties of this thing but she yeah. created it and yeah so I, I yeah i find that very fascinating and, and just the fact that she pulls a mathematical puzzle into this world mm-hmm. so a puzzle is something that you can't really that is difficult to solve but she created it right and it, it, well it seems I, like she I, has so much time to learn the space yeah yeah it's just really fascinating so she has all these other worlds and she, she goes through them um and, and, and lists them at one point let me read that part so she she lists these pocket worlds that she tries to search for something to pull out yeah yeah oh i remember that i remember mm -hmm. that yeah so quoting there was the high temple fault line in the hypnotist they'd hired had talked her through it building a place that wasn't so influenced by l's negative thoughts and ideas it was a place she associated with personal triumphs her inner strengths at the opposite end of the coin was also the bad place of the worlds it was the biggest by far nothing she could use there she knew she was intimately familiar with every aspect of it she had spent a long time there. Then she lists some more. Um, the Lonely Hallways, no. The Burning Towers, definitely no. The Barren Ruins. So we'll, we'll talk more about the Barren Ruins in a second, but just, just this idea of like... Well, actually, let me continue the quote. Okay. The Barren Ruins. She'd almost forgotten. It had been her first attempt at making a world outside the bad place. It had worked up until the moment negativity and self-loathing crept in through the cracks, filling mm. in details where she, had, where she didn't want them ugly details what had resulted was a beautiful solemn landscape rigged with traps and pitfalls as if the landscape itself was eager to hurt or kill anyone who didn't watch their step so it's like it, physical it goes manifestation to of intrusive thoughts yeah what, what's so interesting to me is that it's such it's so the, the power is working on such a metaphorical level right mm -hmm. like in this other world it doesn't there's no people in the other world until she starts bringing bringing that world into the other reality right yeah, yeah so like the pitfalls and traps don't matter in that other world so the idea of like it being self-loathing and negativity and stuff like that the, like the, the, these emotions get translated into things that would actually harm people but it's so like symbolic because there aren't any people there yeah right oh that's so interesting and like pitfalls aren't like that ugly either like i mean i mean i'm sure they are but it's like <laughs> It's only it's it's a, it's a threat, but you need a you need an actor there to for mm -hmm. that threat to be a threat, right? Yeah. Um, it just has potential energy. Yeah. So I just find it so fascinating that like her brain works with her power to change this emotion to that ends up like infecting this place. Yeah. Uh, and turning into something else. I don't yeah. know. It's like houses it, for mm -hmm. her emotions. Yeah, it's so in her mind. Mm-hmm. I'm really having trouble articulating it. Um, but uh, it says that everything turned ugly, unpredictable, and dangerous. Yeah. yeah. So um, the way that I was looking at this as like a metaphor, her, her power in general, right, is uh, so, so later on we see her, when she starts interacting with Brent Scar, the bad place starts creeping in, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it comes from the asylum, it, it's influenced by the idea of the asylum and there, but it's so much worse, right? It's like, uh, yeah. uh, what's that game? Not resident evil, the evil within there's, there's like a dangerous hospital in there. It's like a silent hill where it's these, this haunted place that is unreal, right? Like here's the thing, like yes, the asylum that she was in, I'm sure was really bad for her mentally. Right. Mm -hmm. But it did not have, uh, razors taped to the walls and sticking out everywhere. It did not have metal bars over the door, probably, anyway. Yeah. We're, we're, tattered... we're presuming a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it seems uh, like she's kind of let her mind... Or not let, it, like her mind has embellished on her memory. Yeah, and so the, the way that I'm viewing it, especially it, it, from the context of her like sitting inside the asylum as her environment slowly becomes this exaggerated version of it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of how when we sit, when we stay in our, you know, terrible uh, emotional states, our perception of reality of our environment around us changes to suit that. And it's this feedback loop 
that makes it even worse. Yeah. So she hated the asylum, so her environment started turning into this hated place, and that made her feel even worse. Because I think she can she can get hurt by her own power, I think, if she's not careful. Oh. Which is really interesting because she can actually, she can make other people immune, but she can't make herself immune, I don't mm-hmm. think. I mean, if she's in control, I'm sure she can move the stuff out of the way, but it's a physical thing to her. Yeah, yeah. Um, which uh, brings us to Burn Scar. So Burn Scar actually, I think, fo- uh, serves as a, a foil to a Labyrinth. Um, Burn Scar comes in and it's just really, it's such an interesting re- interaction where Burn Scar was trying to murder people, but now the mm-hmm. fire is out. So the thing that was, you know, making her go extra violent is gone now. And she appears and she just tries to have a normal conversation and she thinks that they're friends. Yeah, it's and... such a radical shift in her behavior mm-hmm. of, like, entering and... this space and then speaking to Labyrinth. Yeah, and it's so sad because yeah. she she really does think that Labyrinth is her friend. And at the end of it, when she realizes, she asks, were we friends? And Labyrinth doesn't answer. Mm-hmm. There's a moment of anger, but then she's just apologizing. She says, like, fuck, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm really sorry, you know. I can't help it. And... Um, she she decides to leave. It's yeah, it, it's a really sad moment. There's so there's two things I want to point out here. Um, when she leaves, uh, Labyrinth decides to hug her, right? And she she lies saying that we had some good times, and yeah. that's like uh, she's just doing that. I I mean, on one hand, she could be doing it just to make sure that Brent Scott doesn't go kill some more people, right? Mm. Which is possible, but also it's just like a nice thing to do. Yeah, it for, seemed like, it, seemed like it was a, like a comfort provided yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, like softening the blow, mm-hmm. right? Saying, yeah, we weren't friends, but yeah, we totally had some good times. You don't have to feel awful about thinking that we had some good times, um, even though she probably should. Yeah. So the the way that I think that it works as a foil, right, is that Burn Scar, uh, she... Her, her, when her, she uses her power, her inhibitions go away, right? She feels less guilty about things. Mm. Um, there's a quote here. She says that she can't help it, um, hurting people with the, with the fire. And Elle in her, her head insists that she can. She just doesn't try hard enough. Uh, Bryn Scar says, when I'm in the headspace, I don't want to leave it. And another thought follows from Labyrinth. Yeah, and you retreat into that state to avoid facing the guilt over things you've done. Use it to hide from your own fears. If I blame you for anything, it's for that. Then there's another little exchange. Can't, uh, Labyrinth saying, can't keep hurting people, Mimi. I have to. I can just use my power. Stay in that headspace where I don't feel bad, where I act the way the nine expect me to. And so I think the, 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 both of their powers make them retreat into this other state where they don't interact with reality, right? And make, yeah, both of their yeah. powers make them escape from reality. But labyrinths is more they're they're both unintentional right they don't when their power activates they go whether they want to or not right Mm -hmm. yeah but labyrinth really mm -hmm. labyrinths is usually a bad place right Mm -hmm. bird scar is a place where while it might not be good it is not bad right and so yeah Labyrinth is trying to so hard. She she tries so hard to get out of it, right? So I think she gets especially upset. And in fact, there's a couple parts where it basically says that she's outraged, where Burnscar isn't trying to get out of that state mm-hmm. because it's good for her. Yeah, it seems like it seems like. I mean, this this is more of like a generalization about like all a lot of the nine is that because because they are they are not the kind of evil that has like like deep intentions i guess Mm -hmm. they're just kind of chaotically evil Mm -hmm. where they i mean i guess mannequin kind of has like but i mean his goals it's not it's not like step by step like how coils is or like there is there isn't like this intentionality in every single moment um Mm -hmm. i feel like a lot of them have like have to kind of build that into even if they didn't have it before like burns car seems seems to have had it before she joined the nine um but it seems like a lot of them kind of have to create that headspace to enter into in order to like participate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that headspace where they aren't viewing reality how it really is, mm-hmm. where people aren't people. Yeah, 
They're just things that you can burn. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing I want to point out is how uh, Labyrinth is tries pretty hard to not hurt people with her power. I mean, I don't know, it, in fights and stuff, but in this interaction anyway, uh, the those razor blades are coming in and she intentionally like pushes them away and she asks Burnscar if she can touch her to anchor her and protect her from her space. Um, but Burnscar is the total opposite of that, mm -hmm. um, where she will subject people to her internal uh, turmoil as much as possible because she can. Yeah, yeah. And possibly it just, it feels good. I think there's also something else that you could read in there about how she retreats into that destructive, li literally retreats into that destructive place as a way to attack people, right? She teleports through fires. Mm, yeah. And how, like, all those destructive places are kind of the same place, right? Be all those fires are, you know, one step away from each other. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. The, the last thing I, I want to point out, so... When Burnscar is going to leave, Elle specifically uses her power to unlock the door, right? Specifically letting Burnscar leave her mind space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of hard to wrap my head around all, all, all of these things. Um, but I think there's... It's interesting just how much is going on with this character and we see so little of her. Yeah, that we really get like a really deep look um, in just this... In this interlude, I think, mm -hmm. um, and because both we, we don't really see a lot of like like Hotline's crew later on, and then Burns Girl kind of isn't as involved as some of the other pieces or other people, not pieces <laughs> of the nine. I don't know why I said pieces, but we see Burns Girl. I think like just really only twice more. We see her fight mm -hmm. um, uh, with with Mannequin and burn down Skitter's place, right? Yeah, so yeah. she didn't learn anything from her talk with Labyrinth, obviously, but no. you know. That's that, that's that was going on. It, I mean, the, the chapter ends with um, Labyrinth saying, "It would be weeks before she had made up the ground she had just lost in terms of her mental health." Which is interesting. The word "ground" there, mm. uh, considering the ground is literally transforming into her mental space. Yeah, yeah. And pushing past the bad memories in the bad place. Uh, again, also that Labyrinth is literally the the term going staying in the bad place right mm -hmm. I'm in a bad place, and she literally is. Yeah. Um. She reassured herself with the thought that she would get better in time. She'd gotten there once. She could get there again if the others were okay. As for Burn Scar, there would be no helping that girl. And yeah, it it does go that way. The only other time we see her is with Imp, uh, just going to visit the slaughterhouse nine, and in that she's just casually lounging with the rest of the nine and and yeah. playing with fire a little bit. So, yeah. Yeah, she. How do, I don't remember. How does she die? Um, Brian smashes her head in with a Siberian. Oh. Hit with his Siberian projection, whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a pretty gruesome way to go, but it is. Yeah. But it's not like yeah. prolonged. No, no, it was, it was quick. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's, the thing is that just I, I think the main tragedy with Brinscar is just like it, it, it. she could have had that support network. Yeah, and it's just like it's you, you get in this place and it's really relatable. Like you, get, you get in this place where you think that you can't try and so you don't. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it harder to try the next time, right? Because the more she doesn't try, it's the more people she hurts and the more guilt she ha she gets. Yeah, so it's and like so, insurmountable Yeah, by the time I, I, that she has time to think about it. Yeah, I mean, that's the point she, that when she talks to Labyrinth, the only person that is possibly in her support network, mm -hmm. right? I mean, not really, but... But like... And, yeah, not and, not quite, but she has the potential yeah. too. Yeah, uh, and Labyrinth says, "Go to the birdcage, right? Mm -hmm. You you would be safe there. You you know, you just you would stop hurting people as much." And Brinster's like, "No, I can't. I I can't. I can't do it." Mm -hmm. And whether or not you know, it's true that she could. I mean, I think it's likely that they could kill her, but like, it's probably still worth trying, Burn Scar, because otherwise you're going to hurt more people. Come on. Yeah, she's um, kind of stuck. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's just a really sad place to get into when someone who needs help gets into a place where they are basically choosing not to help themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard to, like, what, what, what is the line there, you know? I, I think Labyrinth is also, when she's saying that you don't try and stuff like that, I mean, she's, you know, also viewing it from her own perspective. Maybe it's a lot harder to try as as Burns Car. Yeah. I mean, you don't yeah. know what it's like in her head. They're so. each in their own, their own, like, journeys, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think about stuff like that 
a lot about just like what I mean, what is in the in a in the deterministic universe, right? What is willpower? What is the ability to choose to do things, right? Yeah. So, mm. and then thinking about that probably erodes your agency a bit too. So, yeah, it's just um, uh, it's so frustrating. So often it's like when you spend too much thinking, when you spend too much time thinking about things, it only makes it worse. Yeah. Because then you're like stuck Which, in this. Um, I think it's the theme for for my stuff on this episode because was, the deconstruction stuff really it's too really much me out a bit. Yeah. So, well, that's what I have for for labyrinth. Yes. Um, and uh, unless if you have anything else to to mention, we'll go on to yours. I think I think that sums up labyrinth pretty well. We can. I think so. Step into cherish. Mm-hmm. Um, hold on, let me move my coffee so it doesn't make funny little noises. Okay. Okay, Cherish. Yes, so Cherish, um, Cherish is one of the nine. As I so as I was kind of reading, and I mean, obviously we know that, but at the same time, she she is not. She doesn't like quite fit the bill, because mm-hmm. I mean, there there I, she is. She she does have this sort of like chaotic evil that I was talking about before, where it's like unpredictable and like they have this sort of like murderous methodology that's um, not really like goal oriented. But hers, she kind of does have a goal, um, in the way that the others don't, um, of, and it's, it's, I mean, it's not like a forward moving goal, it's a, to not be, like, to be safe or be protected and have that protection from her, you know, family Mm -hmm. that she left from, right? Via mind controlling the nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, where she's kind of, she, yeah, yeah, where she, I don't know, she, she, she's a, she's a complicated one to kind of piece together um Mm -hmm. because like while at the same time that she is part of the nine like she's still like she tucks away pieces of herself that like so that she in in response to i think i would say in response to the kind of like karen stick dynamic of the way that jack runs the nine like what was the word you just used uh oh carrot and stick sorry i interpreted that as a a theorist name i had never heard before (laughs) mysterious you know carrot stick Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so when, like, before, before she even enters, um, she, she already has this kind of, like, warped sense of the world, the same way the region does, where, like, she didn't grow up in this, in this, like, warm idea of childhood. It was, it was this, like, very competitive, very, like, she already has that, like, paranoia and, like, suspicion, I, I would say, of, of mm-hmm. her, of, like, you know, her siblings, which I would say, as, as, like, a very young child, I mean, not me, but, like, Hold on. The the concept of, like, growing up with people that you cannot trust, mm-hmm. like, kind of ruins your, your, like, your ability to trust sometimes. Right. Or makes it very difficult um, to easily hand that out. And then at the same time, she's kind of, like, she doesn't have the empathy um, that's, like, usually taught or demonstrated, this sort of thing, like, learned. Um, so she, she just has spent, like, her childhood learning how to play with emotions and not think about them in any sort of, like, serious way, I guess. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. She feels people's emotions, mm-hmm. but she doesn't empathize with them, even though she literally feels them. Yeah, but it's not the same where Regent, he he wants what we were talking about before, where he wants to want mm-hmm. to be able to empathize. She doesn't have that. Mm-hmm. Like, it's like she she's sort of like accepted that she cannot. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I, I, maybe even acceptance isn't... Well, is it acceptance if, like, you didn't consider it in the first place? Yeah, yeah, I think that's what it is. Whereas, like, she, because of because of the way that she, or the way that she conceptualized the world um, as, like, a child, she doesn't think to think about that. You're right, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Her, oh, yeah, it's like that, it's like that physics poetry theorist who was, I don't remember what his name is, but the the one who was talking about, like, the imaginary space is, is that, like, first environment you know, the child mm-hmm. in her first environment did not have empathy, did not have mm-hmm. the the deep consideration of emotions at all. Yeah, um, it didn't exist in there. Yeah, yeah. So she was kind of like, she was she was just sort of handed this hostile environment. Yeah, I mean, like to her dad basically go, going around, everyone's emotions are whatever he wants them to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If he wants people to, to love him, they love him. If he wants people to be terrified, they're terrified. Mm-hmm. What... Yeah, it skips all the intervening steps of actual action and just gets to the effect. Yeah, yeah. 
Which is also something to note of, like, the ability to control oneself Mm -hmm. and, like, one's bodily emotion or, like, all of that, like, autonomy wasn't something to be enjoyed or to, like, to be had. Um, Which kind of feeds into the way that she fits into the Nine and the way that she does not fit into the Nine. Um, But before we go into that, I wanted to, I really wanted to bring up um, the concept at, I mean, I know I talked about the whole, like, music thing the way that she, like, Im- you know, imagines uh, with her power, like, the way that she describes it with music and everything. Um, it got me thinking about this novella that Leo Tolstoy wrote um, about the about Beethoven's Kreutzer Sonata, mm-hmm. um, where the uh, the main character, the husband, he, he, uh, he becomes very, very jealous and suspicious of his wife, who's a violinist, and her piano player. Um, because they're both like learning the Kreutzer Sonata, and the the husband is like the music. The composer has instilled emotion into you by performing mm-hmm. this, and has instilled and you know sort of transferred that emotion into me because I'm sitting here listening to it. And so he like, I mean, he murders her in a jealous rage. I think um, is how it ends up. I, th- I I don't quite remember how the end how the mm-hmm. ending goes, and and we don't really know like if they had the affair or not. It doesn't really matter. It's it's the emotion that has been, you know, stirred up, incited by the music right. itself. Um, so, like, the music, like, implies that the violinist and whoever and, and the piano player are in love? Or is it that the music is, is supposed to inspire jealousy specifically? Well, it gets sort of wrapped up um, okay. and muddled because it's, like, the it, inc- it incites both the idea of, like, lust between the two players, but then also jealousy and anger. Um, and suspicion and paranoia and all of this, mm. um, because I mean the the scene where the, like where it's being performed, the main character is describing the rest of the audience, and he's describing them as as also being sort of like riled up by this. Mm. Um, and then that was that was kind of like a thing that Tolstoy he had this whole essay about like art and and music of like of you know this this like transfer of of emotion from the composer to the to the listener to the viewer. Um, which was, it was just a very, I, I don't know if I fully agree with it, but it was just an interesting thing to think about um, in terms of Cherish and mm-hmm. where how she thinks about the way that she kind of, you know, picks apart and pushes at emotions as, as she becomes this sort of like arranger or composer sort of thing, director, you know, mm-hmm. creating dissonance um, in each individual. But yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I find her her power really fascinating because it's just she understands so much, like not not just the feeling of the emotion, but what those things are tied to. Mm-hmm. She's the closest to a mind reader in in the story, I think. Yeah, because she she's able to pick apart the emotion and how it's tied to like specific facts mm-hmm. and, and interpretations and feelings, and it's and it's not just like each individual. She can read it like at an interpersonal level and everything. Yeah. Yeah. I hope she comes back. I really like her. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what happens at the end of, of Arc 14, right? Yeah, I know. But, I mean, it's, She's it's kind of... She's at the bottom of, yeah, of the but, ocean. I mean, but, like, she'll... With you a know, she could come back. Mannequin organs made to feel the negative emotions of the entire city. That's... She'd be very different when she returned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. Hmm. Yeah. But, okay, so... Um, back to her kind of, like... Her first like entry into into the nine, um, because I go a lot into like, kind of the the background of it, because mm-hmm. it seemed very relevant to like her actions, um, specifically of like when the scene where we see we first kind of enter, um, with with uh, the undersiders and the travelers, um, kind of standing and conversing with with um, uh, with the nine, like, mm-hmm. you know, when the right. When the when, villains when are like off Cattle chatting and everything, face is cut open. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, um, and and so Jack kind of describes what uh, what he asked her to to give up to like break of herself, you know, to uh, in order right. to like make her part of the nine, like to kind of mark her um, and irrevocably change. And um, it was interesting to note that it was that it was um, he he took like control over her body, right. Um, in the way of like, well, specifically because he's the one he like. I mean, I guess Mannequin did this, but it was it was Jack that made him, that made her do everything over again. Um, mm-hmm. Is that like 
the tattoos and and even even in the moment where where he's like recounting this whole thing where he he she like she's required to bear her body to show like evidence as a demonstration of it yeah it's just that she doesn't have it's the same thing of like what she was stuck in as a child is that she doesn't have that autonomy over herself Mm. um which i think is why it, it why so often um she she uses her power even like almost unthinkingly to exact control over others Mm-hmm. It's because she doesn't have that over herself necessarily. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, the the inscriptions on the the tattoo are also like they they are all putting words in her mouth, yeah. right? Yeah. But they're they're all in such an ironic sense. The, the the phrases on there next to these bodies are of I, I, the one on I, I forget which side of her it is, but one of them is right of this two old women basically like having sex and one is morbidly obese and the other one is like emaciated Mm -hmm. and all around is like want me um and other phrases like that and it i feel like another one is like take me and help me or something like that this very like objectified or like this this like warped sense and it seems like it's not even necessarily her preoccupation with like like the definition of beauty and like maintaining that it seems more that it's that has been imposed upon her mm-hmm. by everyone else of like because she's not the one that's like recounting this tale right so it's like yeah he's saying it was you know it was when you willingly defaced that young unblemished body of yours that a little something inside of you broke and you began to think of yourself as one of us is that it seemed like he was the one that had kind of set that as the standard mm-hmm. um and then yeah i wonder what part of that thought was actually what got the cherish yeah because i don't know if it if it if it really was that, you yeah, because like it seemed like she kind of like the physicality of like her herself. She had she like never really necessarily had power over that. And then like even later on, I mean not later on earlier when we're in her head, you know, she's thinking about like, you know, when she goes and asks, like when she speaks to the man, and and he's like, oh, do you need help? And she's like, do you think I'm pretty? Mm-hmm. But it's not really it's not really about her kind of seeking this, you know, affirmation, it's about her kind of, like, setting up this conversation to happen, right? Um, and her yeah. taking control of the conversation. Yeah. She um, it kind of does it to make him uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because he, right before that, he's talking about, like, his his kid. Yeah. Um, And then there's another moment of it where she's talking about uh, where, like, all of her clothes, everything that she's wearing, um, like, everything she owned, everything she used day to day was stolen. Right. And it wasn't like she didn't have money. Yeah. It was she had that option. What stopped her was the fact that she had a pattern going. Right. And then it's like that the very act of stealing, like of, of kind of being able to exert control over something besides herself, over her besides her body um, and like where she goes and everything. Right. So she's she's she has to go with the rest of the nine wherever they take her, um, that she's kind of she's still living in that. She she's living in that, like not stopping, like not quite there yet except in like this liminal space that's mm-hmm. but it's not it's not necessarily the exactly the liminal space of the nine in their entirety do you know what i mean mm-hmm. where like i mean they're on the move and everything so and and it makes sense that you know that she would have this this pattern of of wearing things from different places all this changing out but to me it seemed like it, it was even more than like she was using these like material objects that were not hers to kind of to like not settle into where she like how she was functioning yeah with the nine yeah. it, 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 it the thought strikes me that when you buy something it becomes yours yes right yes but if she's stolen everything nothing on her is hers because mm-hmm. it's all someone else's so by making sure that everything that is on her body is not hers it's kind of reinforcing that this body is not hers right now yeah yeah she doesn't so have maybe to take- it, she has. She doesn't have to kind of pick through what is and is not hers. What pieces that she is able to keep for herself. Yeah, because um, it's all not her. Yes. It's, yeah. So she doesn't have responsibility over kind of what this body does. Mm-hmm. Um, which, which is actually an, a thing to note of where like she she doesn't feel like she has control over herself, and she also sort of in a 
slightly different tack, but still attached to the concept of like her not quite fitting in with the nine, um, is is that she nominated herself to join the nine. Right. It wasn't that they had picked her out. Um, and she nominated herself in order because she was like on the run, right? From because her 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 siblings like kept coming back to get her. At, like every time she ran away, because um, she was she was um, speaking to Regent Plan. But okay, anyway, so she was speaking to Regent about about um, like what happened after he left, mm-hmm. where she's like thought you should know that things got pretty shitty at home after you left. Daddy got really overprotective, angry. It sucked. All of this. Like she's kind of she's stuck. Okay, so so she was sort of stuck there when Regent left, and then when she left, she couldn't. It was it was it all kind of got jumbled up. Where like I'll go back to okay, I'll I'll start with the time bomb. I think, mm-hmm. um, because she has okay, so she has this time bomb right where it's like she has created for herself this cycle of anticip anticipatory death, mm-hmm. um, that is both insurance for her, but then also to me says that she's anticipating not like making out making it out of being with the nine like she's accepted the fact that she will have to die with the nine but then at the same time mm-hmm. it's it's also functioning as like another piece of like power over herself yeah because she, she's in control of her own death mm-hmm. even though she's not in control of her own death yeah where she's kind of like she's built in these small pieces of control that mm-hmm. would not be recognizable um especially because she's like she's still sp- you know, kind of placed in that liminality with the nine, but then she's like created her own, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then by by nominating Regent, she kind of like brings him into that. She like brings him into her specific kind of vein of liminality because she knows that he's also going to die. Like she's basically given him a death sentence. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like, I suppose it could have like they call it payback i guess but it seems like it's not like she knows that she's going to die too i don't know it it, it seems like this this they have a very peculiar sibling bond mm-hmm. to me <laughs> i would i would agree with that that that's what all of this like blundering that i'm doing is about is they're very difficult to figure out because they don't like they have they have a childhood that they grew up together yeah and they both escaped it and they both escaped it but then it's that whole thing of like like it's it's the whole thing of like um Anne Sexton and Sylvia Plath of like you left me you know yeah um and so then there's and like resentment kind of, that builds up because of that yeah it's it kind of breeds a I mean this isn't quite the same scenario but the crabs in the bucket kind of idea yeah. of like pulling someone else down just because they're above you and yeah then no yeah. one gets out because he found he found something that he found a space where he could you know he has the potential to survive but she because because he left first was kind of forced into a situation that she didn't necessarily want to join i mean she says that she it's because like she joins also because of boredom and all of this but like the main reason she joins the nine is for that protection that they offer yeah um which really goes to show you how bad home is yeah it's it's terrible if she wants to it's terrible check up with like... mass serial mass murderers and tattoo herself all over just to get away from home yeah yeah um yeah, it's quite a choice that she makes, but I don't know. It just it seems quite foolhardy at the same time, or like oh, yeah, naive sure. that she thinks that one that they won't notice. Both like her sort of you know creating this dependency, but then secondarily that it would work, I guess. And I I feel like we we covered this in the last episode, but the concept like of individuals that that don't really quite grow as attached as what she's hoping, I guess. I don't know. It, they they don't have like the same level of emotions to be influenced. Yeah, like the nine, just because even, even if they loved her, wouldn't necessarily stop them from killing her. Yeah, like they don't. They don't. They're too chaotic for that. Like they don't have yeah. the r- rationale. It, you I guess. you can put the emotion in them, but you don't know exactly what that emotion is going to do. Mm-hmm. Like even if she just fills them with apathy, right? I mean, Jack needs a single swish of his knife to kill you. Yeah, and you might just do that out of boredom. So. Yeah, that seems like there's, that's, like, even, even her own sort of, like, explanation, you know, is, is that she's like, oh, there's this idle boredom. Um, but do you wonder why she didn't, like, brute force them beforehand, you know? Like... What do you mean? I mean, I, I guess I understand she approached them as a group originally, but she brute forces that soldier, right, into being completely mm, obedient yeah, to her. Yeah. And I'm just wondering why 
Why she I, I guess she's, she's not fast enough to, to do it on a whole, you know, eight people at the same time. Yeah. Or nine people, actually, because I think the nine was filled. Yeah. When, oh, yeah, because she had um, to... When she tried to join, yeah. Oh, but... Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Perhaps it's perhaps it's a limitation on her um, her own powers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. All right, what's your next section on here? Oh, yeah, and then I want to talk about also... Um, after like after her plan has like been articulated by Tattletale and she's kind of like living with the nine, but then also like waiting for whatever's going to happen. Um, mm-hmm. she's like she she's dealing with this with this anticipatory fear in addition to her sort of like cycles of of like, you know, making sure she doesn't die and she's kind of like she's stuck in this this waiting period again. Which she was stuck with that, um before before she met up with the nine. But after she had left um, her family, that she was kind of, like, in this, like, waiting for her family to come back and to, like, take her, make her, like, force her to return and everything. So she's kind of, like, stuck in that headspace again. Mm -hmm. Um, But this time she doesn't wait. She doesn't wait. um, And then she she readily, she readily gives up her autonomy um, to Coil and to the the Undersiders and everything so that she, she constructs a way out of her liminality that... Um, uh, in a in a way that perhaps guarantee, um, that doesn't guarantee death. You know what I mean? Like with the nine and with her family, there is that almost certainty that she could be killed. But then if she turns herself over to like Coil and the Undersiders and everyone, that she it's a it's really uncertain point. And they do debate killing her, mm-hmm. but they're all unsure. Yeah, there's there's not as much like like a, a guarantee of of dying. Yeah. Or of, like, completely losing bodily autonomy in the way that she did the previous two situations. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But then she's still sort of, like, stuck in the way that she, like, manages her own fear, which is to, like, mm-hmm. externalize onto other people. Um, yeah. She's almost, she's almost like, um, like an, uh, like a extension of Tattletale of, like... Yeah. They, they have the same kind of behavior. Where, like, they... The more... The, the the more uh, scared and unsure they are, the more they deflect with humor and needling other people. They both do mm-hmm. the same thing. But she's sort of like, um, I feel it could be important. I don't know. It, and I find something interesting here, uh, reflecting on how she kind of continually double crosses everyone in, in this particular section, right? So she's with the Nine and uh, eventually makes a deal with Imp, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, then gets taken to... It, it taken into Coyle's custody and is sort of cooperating, but sort of on the nine side. It, it finally, like ending on cooperating, and then once the miasma hits, she flips to the other side and says, t- "Tells them where she is." And because she knows who they it are, gives still, them a clue. Right? Hmm? She knows who they are still. Oh yeah, because it it wasn't able to affect her. Yeah, because she's under the the ocean. Yeah. yeah. Or no, she was in a buoy, I think. Regardless, uh, the like she, she was on the ocean, and the uh, parasite doesn't go into the salt water. Mm. But yeah, so she she continually does this thing where she just like gets herself in a worse and worse situation, right? She, or she starts getting a decent situation when she makes a deal and gets captured, mm-hmm. right? Um, well, okay, l- l- let me take a step back. So she makes a deal with Imp. But that doesn't actually go through because she's captured before then. And and when that's happening, right, a Ballistic is going to, like, execute her. And she, like, manipulates his emotions, even though, like, no one else notices. Mm, yeah, yeah. It, he's like, oh, she looks like a girl I knew. And it's it's kind of obvious, like, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, she doesn't. Um, and uh, so she, but she still, like, uh, gets shot, I think. Um, she just, just doesn't die. Oh, yeah, die. she does, yes. And yeah. she gets, but does she, she also, she gets bitten? Yeah, I think so, by a bunch of spiders and such. Mm-hmm. The same thing as Shatterbird, I think. But yeah, so she gets into Cole's custody and like, they they are helping her, right? So like, she could do something to, to, to get more help, but, but no, she continually like antagonizes them. Coil kick, or Skitter kicks her in the face. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, she, she puts herself back into the Nine's hands at the end for, for what? <laughs> I don't even know why. I, I, yeah, I don't know why like, she like what she was she expecting them to come and I, help her. I assume that like they were going to find her. She she probably thought they were going to find her no matter what. So 
she might as well tell them and then give them that extra information, you know, that Jack is going to end the world yeah. as a little gift. But of course, that's not enough for the nine. They don't reward loyalty. Yeah, it's also, it's fascinating that she, if if that is like the motivation of her choice to like share that information. Maybe she like just a, wants to be in control. A display of, of loyalty. Because mm-hmm. it's like, where would she have cultivated that? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then like, I mean, I mean, I guess it does sort of like reinforce the concept of like knowledge as control and like knowledge as power. But I don't know. She just kind of, I don't know. She never really fully has control of herself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Hmm. But, huh, I don't know. But then it's, I don't know. I, well, I was thinking about this, too, of, like, we can't... I mean, she didn't have a, a good environment as a child to grow up in. But even after she leaves it, she's still sort of, like, stuck in that, that like, mentality. Mm-hmm. Um, and, like, that behavior that she doesn't she doesn't really stop. Yeah. So it's... I don't know. There's There's a repeated, you know, theme... Not a theme here, but just a notion of people not believing that they can people starting out in situations that they can't control doing bad things and then being outside of the law so that they can never re-enter normal society even if they do get better mm-hmm. and you know that's with burn scar that's with cherish they both think well i've done all these bad things there's no way they're not gonna yeah, there's no way they're, to they're, they're gonna let me go so i might as well live free and even if i'm continually doing bad things mm-hmm. yeah and both of them both burn scar and cherish don't they they're the least of the nine. 90. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have a I have a tier list. I think I think I might have mentioned the last episode. Yeah, I feel so like I'm, we did. I'm reluctant did. to run through it again. Yeah. But yeah, with Cherish and, and Burn Scar for sure are on the bottom of that list. Yeah. Mm. Shatterbird also feels like she doesn't quite belong, even though she does. It's like she Jack causes, and, she and causes Bonesaw a lot of destruction. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, and death. well, that that's that's the thing that brings her in, but her motivations are not like chaotic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jack slash uh, Jack Bonesaw Crawler and Siberian are all like chaos for chaos's sake, yes. right? Their, their motivations yes. are violence specifically because violence is an inherent good. Mm-hmm. Where Shatterbird is more of like a I don't know honor kind of thing, or she just wants to be the best i guess something like that yeah and so and that's also sort of crawler's mentality too of like he's he engages in so much in order to like mm-hmm. be better than himself yeah you know mm. yeah it, um and mannequin i forgot uh but mannequin, mannequin has like a goal. not for yeah he's not for chaos but he's for specifically hurting people yeah, right yeah yeah he has like a vendetta yeah anything else you want to talk about with cherish um, I think that is it. But I mean, I'll have more to say um, when I get talking about um, the essay portion. All right. Uh, well, before we get into your essay, let's do our little, what well, our first of our three little bits. Let's talk about some favorite moments that we missed. Uh, we won't always repeat our bits, but I, I feel like this is probably a pretty good one to yeah. return to. Especially because like we, we skip over so much. Mm-hmm. It's nice that we can like. Especially this time. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, what like were some of your favorite moments, Clarence? Mm-hmm. My favorite um, is the breakfast that I <laughs> was very enthusiastic about before. Yeah, you mentioned it a bunch of times, and then like the I, there was not a moment to just yeah, talk I about mean, it, it wasn't specifically really, like, to explore that influential in the plot, and it was really mm-hmm. even just kind of background to what was happening, you know, because like. It's 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 sort of like the after moment of of the tense conversation between Brian and Taylor and then Taylor and and um, Aisha Rachel no oh or yeah. Aisha, yeah yeah all three of them first and then and then Taylor and Rachel but like it's just this sort of like background where she's just kind of like cooking away making their food you know and then like the travelers show up and they're eating breakfast and it's just this whole thing and it seems mm-hmm. nice. But even while yeah i mean even i mean there's yeah, tenseness even, even and all of this and all of this mess all this interpersonal mess but like they're all eating breakfast together and it just seemed mm-hmm. like a, a nice moment to sort of stop and reflect drink coffee eat eggs mm-hmm. for the for yeah one of the few times you can throughout yeah the well because like, days of chaos th- yeah they don't really like think about oh my god yeah when do they eat th- yeah there's so much there's when so does much Taylor eat? like <laughs> detail of everything else 
and she thinks about so much like i would i would f- i feel like she would carry around granola bars mm-hmm. you know yeah talking uh, thinking about eating in a war zone is just a such a terrifying concept yeah like, w- what a strange way to feel vulnerable it's just food yeah hmm. speaking of food uh you should catch up on pale it's pretty good is it about um, food uh one particular section is oh. uh so the next uh, so special moment that I have, um, just I just want to mention how Hookwolf's power makes him move. Mm-hmm. There's just something. I actually think about this a lot. It just it just comes into my mind a lot. I don't know why, but the whole idea of how he takes the shape of a wolf, right? But he doesn't actually move the legs. The legs just extend and retreat. That's so in odd. In a way that looks like he's moving. Yeah. They just like continually extend from his center to to go down and back Mm -hmm. and that pushes him forward repeatedly and he maintains that shape of the wolf i don't know there's just something really interesting about that that's such an odd way to move Mm -hmm. and he doesn't have to move that way no he doesn't that's chatterbird's point you well that's the other thing is that like he doesn't have to move that way but that way is so much more interesting than what would probably be the objectively best way which is just to be like a ball of hooks and spikes Mm -hmm. And just roll forward. That that would be the fastest way to move, but it but would be far like, oh, less interesting than forming a wolf. Yeah. So strange. I don't know. There's so many like movement oriented discussions of mm-hmm. you know because like when you think about yeah. like Shadowstalker and and I feel like a whole section of like Fletchette's um, interlude was was contemplating mm-hmm. like and discussing how to move and and the logistics of it and not knowing the city so it's more difficult and tedious and all of this Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know it just it makes you so much more aware of like the the landscape yes yes yeah um on on movement it's something that's easy to miss is that shatterbird's flight is not normal flight Mm. she's from all the glass shards she presses against her own body and she lifts those up and that lets her move oh Oh, she has that dress made of oh yeah yeah scintillating colored glass shards yeah dang huh. there's it's just such there's so many good visuals in this mm-hmm. you know mm. yes yes well another another um scene that i really liked um that we didn't get to touch on before was in the aftermath of um in like the sort of solving part of the miasma with all those mm-hmm. like misfolded proteins and everything um taylor's like walking around with the cure um, in her saliva, and so she yeah. she walks up to bitch and you know gives her a peck on the lips and is like you're cured, <laughs> and then bitch punches her right. Yes. Right after. Ah, yes. Wonderful, wonderful scene. That's that's yes. such a hilarious moment. It's such a great moment of of lev- levity and tension release yeah, after yeah uh, the nine. It was just. Because you arrive there and like it's already kind of tense, but Tattletail is there, so it, like like you know it, there's the tension of the miasma, mm-hmm. but Tattletail's there, who kind she kind of knows what's going on, and yeah, then you have some some kisses and comedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's great. It was a great scene. <laughs> Delightful. Uh, yes. So uh, another little moment we didn't talk about it much, but um, Theo's lines in in his interlude, right? Um, uh, the, he, he, there's just a lot of good ones i remember a lot um but stuff like she doesn't love me but she likes me mm-hmm. which is just just a lot with with so much in there right uh, cool. so, so much background in there he's it, like he knows mm-hmm. and it's something that purity is kind of in denial of but he yeah he's a no he knows it and he kind of accepts it and it's yeah which is so and sad. then yeah it's very yeah and then uh him staring into jack's eyes saying people like you sir i'd kill ah. which is such a wonderful moment of bravery on his part yes i'm i hope i feel like he's going to come back and we'll see more of him mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. when we do i'm very excited yes because i feel like he yes. has great potential yeah i hope he becomes a badass of it after his two years mm-hmm. okay uh that's the favorite moments we had uh, there was I, I was trying to think of more and there's for sure a lot more and i just couldn't think of them because it's three hundred fifty thousand words and it was hard to sift, sift through it all but yeah yeah um, it's so hard to like i had so many things i wanted to pull from and i feel like i couldn't find mm-hmm. them all 
Well, I mean, just to mention it real quick, Flechette's movement again is just really fun. Mm -hmm. I I really wish we could see it. When she's describing it, it feels like really chunky and stuff. But like, I got kind of frustrated actually reading it because it's like, this should feel so natural. Like you can imagine how it would feel if she, all the, 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 the skyline was all even Mm -hmm. and she could go from rooftop to rooftop sliding down that chain. Yeah. Yeah. It just feels super satisfying, you know, like, like. You know how Spider-Man just feels like right, <laughs> his movement, you know? It, hers does too. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Just like her, with the chain and sliding down, it's like the ultimate parkour. Mm, yeah. Free free movement. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, let's, let's get into the explorations, the things that we keep accidentally calling essays, but they're more like explorations. Yes. So I think you're first, Clarence. Okay. I am first. Okay. Okay. So... Um, so my the the main concept that I'm going to explore is is this sort of constructed authority that's really present, especially within um, this particular arc. This kind of like power over others. That's that's an inter an interpersonal manifestation of power. Um, that in the in the couple in the like few people that I explored was uh, rooted in their rhetoric and like. Um, control over like materiality um and then you want to define materiality real quick yes okay so um in this context i'm i'm going to be discussing um it's really just like about like the like physical body um and sort of and well i guess it's, it's both about the physical body but then also about like material needs um both like of the body and of of like like the living space and and um um, like conditions, material conditions sort of thing. Yeah, so this is like the physical reality that kind of affects someone's mind? Yes, yes. And how they'll act, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's also um, particularly important to note that um, each of the individuals that I look at, in addition to whatever they're using of like control over materiality, control over like um, like the mind, the body, or like the conditions or... Um, using like language to kind of influence that all of them additionally use violence yeah um or the in conjunction, yeah, in conjunction with it um or like turns into violence um and then so with so the individuals that i'll be looking at are jack and jack slash taylor um cherish regent and coil and maybe maybe pico if we if i want to fit it in um but so the the way that it's kind of like parsed out is is uh, Jack and Taylor have a much more like um, language based um, entryway into into sort of like exerting power over others, um, and the way that I sort of uh, sort of thought about it was um, this like interpersonal level of um, Althusser's like concept of interpolation, mm-hmm. um, which can also be. Uh, phrased uh, as like hailing or like you know the recognition of someone's identity and like reading of that identity um yeah and so like by by recognizing that individual um sort of you know prompting them to action Mm -hmm. um but in in the more like ideological sense you know in in the more like theory sense it's it's um interpolation is is more tied to like the like state an uh, mm-hmm. uh, individual of the state recognizing, um, um, you know, kind of interpolating an individual, and by by that recognition, turning them into like a subject. Um, right. Althusser is, is writing from a Marxist yeah, perspective. Yeah, he's right? kind so of like he's a kind of a, like a late twentieth century Marxist um, mm-hmm. who was born and he's in Algeria, I think. Um, but he did a lot of writing, like in in France and everything. Was he too? I so was so. Derrida. Yeah. Really. Well, you know. <laughs> um, Those French. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But so he kind of like he he sort of reoriented um, the the kind of discourse, I guess, the like Marxist discourse um, onto mm-hmm. the concept of ideology, and and how much that sort of shaped um, the like social structures and like people's behaviors and and like the material actions and material behaviors. Um, yeah, yeah, and the way that he he sort of like saw 
this the state is like interacting with with the individuals was by that was by like recognizing them as as subjects as as um themselves yeah so subjects as in like people that are subject to the power of whoever is supposed to have the power in in it ideology mm-hmm. and also basically perpetuators of that ideology yeah, by, yeah. by acting within it um yes yeah, so but um the way that i was that i sort of applied it to um jack and taylor's behavior and like the way that they used the way they use rhetoric and and the way that they use um interpersonal interaction and communication um the the way that they sort of like build a rapport i suppose you could say um Mm -hmm. with like the subject of their attention um it's it's not just about the recognition but it's like the step after of like um in the like the convincing and the poking and like needling right that's like of of pulling out that like specific piece of whoever's identity that they like that they see that uh, particularly Mm -hmm. we see a lot with jack of like the keystone that he mentioned is that right um so it's it's not only the the part to manipulate they're also identifying the parts that they want to use mm-hmm. too yeah yeah um, which for both i think is not just their power it's also like the way that they use it the way that they think about it is it, that's even more so with jack who's more interested in like what their dynamic will add to or what how they will add to the dynamic of the nine that he already has yeah yeah um oh yeah 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 so they both um yeah so he, with him, he's, like, specifically looking about how to sort of, like, pull someone apart and, like, how to, like, break them into what he wants them to be. Mm. Um, whereas, like, with Taylor, she also, she doesn't always, she doesn't acknowledge that she's doing this, which I think yeah. is a huge difference between her and Jack. And and because he's, like, intentionally sort of um, manipulating where she she is, is unconsciously, intentionally um, manipulating. Yeah. others to she thinks like so often so so many times she's like oh i don't even know what to say or like i don't want to say the wrong thing all of this and then she says exactly what needs to be said for them to do whatever it is um yeah and she she does it in in the sense of prompting them to immediate action um rather than like a always being like psychological terror or whatever mm-hmm. um yeah because they so they both know how to sort of like speak to whatever it is that that needs to be you know, identified. Um, yeah. So just to take a step back and identify interpolation and stuff a little bit more in Haley mm-hmm. um, as, as we go forward thinking about this. So um, from what I remember reading of the, the, the stuff you were showing me, interpolation and uh, identifying subjects, right? The, the hailing, mm-hmm. the example usually used is with a police officer going to a citizen, hey, you. And by that, uh, just just the notion of who is speaking and how they're saying it, that civilian becomes a, a different kind of subject. Subject They become yeah. someone who needs to follow the law. And so when you turn and, and answer them, you are now immediately part, uh, you are subject to the ideology and uh, you can't really escape from that notion just by, even by, even if you don't think that you believe it, whatever the ideology is. Yeah. If you are participating in it, you are a subject. And there's also, you mentioned before, like, that there is no outside of it. Because mm-hmm. even if you do not align with that ideology, you are still stuck in that, like, dialectic of, like, you know... Uh, this is how you're per- perceived. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, you, you shape your beliefs even around that. Even if you don't believe it, you're saying, I, I don't believe this, so I believe this. You know, it's like, but it's still kind of, like, oriented around that ideology yeah uh, judith butler um was talked about this as well in, in in her own she's a feminist um writer and uh how people are interpolated at birth when they are hailed as it's a boy or girl mm-hmm. or whatever yeah, yeah. and suddenly you are now subject to so many assumptions and um roles that you're now supposed to fit into just by the way that you were hailed that which you had no control over yeah yeah, yeah there's the phrase of like always already a subject you know, where it's like mm-hmm. our identity is has been placed and categorized even before we like existed because those like all those structures like already exist and we were born into them. Yeah. You can't escape society. Yeah. Even if you go into the woods. Yeah. Because yeah. then you are in not society, you know? Yeah. Uh, languages. But back to worm. Anyways, yes, back to worm. Um 
yeah, so both of them, both of them get very wrapped up in being able to kind of, you know, maneuver around each individual's, like, identity and their self, their sense of self, and, right. and what makes them act in particular ways and, and, um, like, what motivates them, um, where, uh, and I, I pulled specifically, this is, this is a little bit, like, this much later, this is, um, in the high school, um, where Jack, like, immediately recognizes that he needs to talk about, um, Marquise? Marquise? Um, uh, Marquis or Marquis. Marquis. There we go. Okay. Um, Amy's father. He, he recognizes that he yeah. needs to talk Amy's about father. Amy's father. Let's just call him Amy's father. Um, cause he, like, by setting up that, that dynamic, she immediately starts thinking about the way that she functions and the way, like, the rules that she has established and, and the limitations and how she's already broken them and all of this, like, he's, he's already, like, kind of pulling them, um, apart just by mentioning that sort of, like, yeah. attachment. Um, yeah. Just by that identification, there's the assumption you are already doomed. Yeah. Um, but then his, like, s- next step is to be, like, you know, what does it matter? Like, that, like, you'll be free after this, and but then free from, like, those rules where, whereas, like, uh, Taylor and she she approaches from the same perspective, um, but then she like takes a different tact of of pulling at like the guilt that that Amy has like internalized and kind of like you know placed upon herself, and then he also he also points out specifically Jack does to Amy um, where he's like I suspect you've never been around someone who actually paid attention to you right so he's like acknowledging that that possibility of of her not being identified, like, you know, seen in the way that she wants to be seen. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but then she totally, like, derails that because she's, like, tattletale did and skitter, right? So it's, like, the, the like, the noticing, like, the acknowledging of, of um, what Taylor did before. She's set herself up. Taylor has set herself up so that she has that entryway into, into like, the negotiation with Amy mm-hmm. um, so, so, so that she can, like, make her demands or whatever. Um, and then, like, immediately sort of, like, throws her under the bus where she's, like, you have to sacrifice, you have to sacrifice yourself. Um, mm-hmm. and then, you know, so she, she, she sets up the same choice, but with totally different reasons. Um, because she sees it the first time, like, it almost works. She just knows that she has to, like, tweak it a little bit. You're saying Taylor tweaks her approach a little bit to affect Amy better. Mm-hmm. As in, the approach from before was... Both times telling Amy to drop her rules to do a thing, right? Yes. To, um, you know, help her, help them fight the nine better, but also fix Victoria. Mm-hmm. And so she refines her approach um, this time to make Amy break her rules again. Yeah. Um, to save everyone. Yeah, it, like it's she 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 appeals to a different um, piece of of um, Amy. Than, than what Jack mm-hmm. did, whereas Jack's is, Jack appeals to the the that like that piece of her that like wants to stop having to mm-hmm. police herself and like impose these things yeah. upon herself. Wants to go burn Scar. Yeah. Um, but then Taylor's like, you have to like you have to acknowledge all of this, um, and the only way to do that is is to stop um, using your rules. Mm-hmm. Is to like is to deal with it. Yeah. Because she's so much more like she's so much more like action-based or like use-based i guess i don't want to say utilitarian Ta- but like she taylor i think is is bordering on utilitarian yeah like she's just she's, just she's so definitely practical. influenced by that but yeah um i mean she would certainly view herself that way yeah but in order to reach that she's like very manipulative right yeah miss telling the girl with the ball of fire that doesn't want to kill people to kill people with her ball of fire yeah, goodness gracious <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, but so so both Jack and Jack and Taylor like they spur others to action like specifically by their words like through their rhetoric. Um, but then in this sort of like they they both of them kind of cr- they're dangerous in the sense that they they manufacture or they sort of like graft the ability to like the the subject to break themselves instead mm-hmm. of instead of like where Regent and Cherish you know, take, like, physical control and, like, exact physical violence or, like, psychological violence directly onto the subject. Yeah. Um, Jack and Taylor just sort of, like, 
almost almost like graft the intention on to the subject themselves where they're the one that mm-hmm. has to do it yeah uh, I, I think a really good example of this is with um rachel right mm-hmm. i mean this is a a example of kind of positive motivation right yeah that's true but, that's true I, I, i'm making this out to the, for taylor like all of this like yeah. quite you know i mean manipulation can be positive yeah. right i guess that's that's a whole debate we can have yeah but um you know rachel betrays taylor right uh, throwing her into dragon's goo mm-hmm. and afterwards uh taylor you know beats her up a little bit but her she emphasizes basically you should feel embarrassed and you should feel bad for um being weak and stuff like that and then we see kind of in in rachel's interview she's kind of has internalized that that she she, it, she does hate that moment of betrayal and disloyalty because she became what she hated yeah yeah and that kind of almost not a, not a reverse psychology, but like a from that seed of the idea, she eventually comes around to trying harder with Taylor yeah. because Taylor because Taylor sets is, it up so that she yeah she must sort of like you know grapple with that herself of mm-hmm. of like she's like she's forced to think about you know like why does why does Taylor like keep returning you know like why why does she take the time to like think through how how Rachel needs to interact you know like where she she meets her where she is instead of like forcing her to kind of like you know adapt to the situation mm-hmm. and learn the nuances she like Taylor sees she breeds her audience um and responds in kind multiple different times and based on like different situations like because she she doesn't she she's not always like quite as like like violent and direct but she's always yeah. she's always attentive to the way that Rachel needs to be spoken to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but she does that, like, for a lot of different people. Um, like, with the travelers and everything, but before the, um, before they go and the whole debacle with, like, Gru and everything, where she's, like, cataloging everything, mm-hmm. thinking about how she will interact with them and how she will, like, how that'll affect, like, the usefulness of the entirety of both of their groups. Of, like, the interpersonal stuff she learns from Cherish and what she's kind of, like, gathered along the way. Yeah. Um, in the moment, she's not she's not thinking about, like, what it means for them. She's thinking about what it means for her mm-hmm. and, like, how she's going to respond to it. Um, yeah. yeah. Not really specifically. The, the way she thinks about a lot of people is not necessarily, like, hey, how must this feel for you, specifically? Mm-hmm. It's through the lens of how must this, how must this feel for you... And then what? What must I do in response to that? How how can I use your emotions? Yeah, um, yeah. To better deal with you. Not so. Not not focusing as much on the empathy part and feeling bad about it, right? On the or, or sympathy, I guess. But on the what what are the, what are the practical realities of the way that you act and the trauma that you faced? Yeah, I, which I think that's why the conversation between her and Brian like go so terribly. <laughs> um, yeah. It's like thirteen ten, where yeah. he's like, "Oh, you're saying you're not being manipulative, like that you you have all of this that was pure motive, like your undercover operation, you know." But you throw yourself in these situations, or you join in, you know, to like whatever fucked up plan the others come up with. All of this, and then he's like, "You're making us dependent upon you, you know." And then she, mm-hmm. she's he he's like, "You know, who who are we supposed to blame besides you?" Uh, wh- like with his situation, where and then she like sort of acknowledges it, but then. At the same time, she's she's still manipulating, like, his response, because she's saying, uh, her response to, like, his accusation is, is, I'll own up to it, like, you know, it's my fault, all this, like, the blame is at least partially mine, and then she goes down this whole list of everybody who's suffered from her actions, and then at the very end, mm-hmm. she's like, I can leave the team if you want, you know, give me the word and I'll leave. It's so guilt-trippy. It's yeah. so guilt-trippy, and it's... And, and it's kind of... Uh, you know, in arc six, mm-hmm. uh, Brian says that he views her or views her like a little sister, yeah. right? Like a sister. And we know how much he wants to protect his sister. Mm-hmm. And so she's, you know, manipulating that part where he wants to protect her. Yeah. It's it's just it, it like I know she doesn't she doesn't necessarily maybe she I, I don't know. Maybe it's that she just hasn't admitted admitted it to herself. Like how much she she really like pulls along like upon others like um responses Mm -hmm. but it's just she does it so often um yeah 
but then so when we start thinking about um beyond like the the rhetoric of um taylor and and jack there's this sort of like more like immediate response of regent and cherish who Mm -hmm. there's their kind of like authority over another's individual or another's another's body like an, another individual's body um is so much more like material and and coil i think is also sort of like attached to this this idea of like materiality which uh, his is like a little bit different because he creates it, it, dependencies that are like you know object based or like um it's it's an in between where it's he is influencing the mental right mm-hmm. like jack and and skitter but using material and physical needs and and desires yeah and if they if they if he doesn't have one then he creates one like with dinah right he like creates all these dependencies um but then like with the other two with the siblings they kind of they 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 physically and impose their their power like it's in order for them to be like fully in control it has to be totalitizing Mm -hmm. um or like totalizing but it's not um like where where even i mean we see when when they're interacting with each other where it's like they don't have power over the other or like when when individuals um like fight back against against their control um i i would say it's i mean it's not it's not that it's not harmful but it's it's less dangerous i think than the power that that taylor and and jack have yeah i mean panacea's you know the the thing she does is so horrifying mm-hmm. because it affects the mind yeah yeah it it's a, a change to your being in a way that body control or even emotional manipulation that's that's short term like that doesn't quite reach yeah. yeah they're kind of so it's definitely i mean they're it's not that they're they don't you know they're that you know like the the they're kind of like breaking of these like intimacy taboos of like over the bodily autonomy or like mind or that sort of thing it's not that that's not terrible it's just the the kind of like docility i guess that comes from that Mm -hmm. isn't isn't as as like devastating i think than than being almost being kind of convinced to do something at like but it feels like your own volition yeah you know yeah um yeah if if regent uh, was a member of the nine and made panacea you know uh, go do horrible things it would be not as bad as if jack convinced panacea to start doing horrible things yeah yeah because then like there's a there's a level of like responsibility that the individual has to take um when they are convinced yeah. um but yeah because the intentionality of of um jack he sort of he sets it up so he can just sort of watch every time. Like it's his his whole chaos. I think it's interesting too because his chaos isn't necessarily immediate. He just sort of like sets up things to fall apart. Yes. Um, which is which I think is almost almost a a foil to Taylor because she sets up things to like keep them together. Like yeah. she's constantly. Or at thinking. least she tries to. Yeah, yeah, she tries to. It's not always she. She's not always successful, but she's always trying to sort of like fit everything into this sort of like linear puzzle. Um, I don't know. She's she. Her mind seems like Tetris to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where she's well, she's always like thinking about how everything's going to fit together and like mm, how she's yeah, going true. to make it fit. Yeah. Um. You know, like even where she's like when when she's asserting like her power. Um. And, and and not really her power, I suppose, but like her authority in in her like territory and um, with her like minions, I guess, mm-hmm. is that she she kind of like she reads the audience of knowing like knowing they need someone with like a she they know she knows that they don't need a fifteen year old girl to tell them what to do, so she like mm-hmm. sets up herself as this like intimidating villain. Um, yeah, where like even no, it was interesting. Not only. A villain, but like an inhuman yeah, one, an inhuman one, one is formed of bugs, mm-hmm. and she's I, and I think that's why she's so dramatic and and why she has all these like extra things that she does. That I mean, it's also mm-hmm. just her being dramatic, but <laughs> she she sets up the image for them to see. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this notion of I, 
I don't know which person it is, but it could be Althusser, it could be Foucault, it could be another uh, Marxist, uh, an Italian Marxist named Antonio Gramsci, but talking about, they, they probably all talk about it, but uh, how the state has, you know, a, a, they didn't talk about this specifically, but the state has a monopoly on violence, mm-hmm. violence right? And so you can order bodies, right, physical bodies, people, yeah. to do things and obey through two kinds of power, right? You've got threat of physical violence, which... Um, you know, a police state will do that, and it, it, states will will use both of these powers. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the other is um, the power of ideology, right? To make mm-hmm. you, they they put it in your mind to to do it yourself, right? And so these people that you're pulling out, Taylor and Jack, are more of that that social power, making people want to do it more. While Regent and Cherish are more of that physical, violent, coercive power. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that's that's definitely absolutely the difference. Um, and I I think looking at it, it seems that while the the violent power is more total, right, like mm-hmm. much more specific, controlling the very specific actions, it is much more tenuous and easier to lose. Yeah. Uh, as as soon as that um, control is lost, you know, if Regent loses control of Shadowbird, she can turn around and you know slice, slice his throat open. Yeah, it's uh, this kind of like the and, the requirement of like constant, you know. Um, like reinforcement of it, I think. Yeah. Um, Once it starts, it can't stop. Yeah, yeah. which is difficult because like power can never be totalitizing. Um, there's always yeah. resistance, which I think that's why the the rhetoric that and like the the I I guess I keep saying rhetoric, but it's more of like the rhetorical arguments that they keep making, Jack and Taylor, mm-hmm. um, and these sort of like convincing, you know, persuasive, you know, speeches and everything. Um, that that creates it it places the the motive or the intention um on the self on their on their subject so that it seems like they're not being told what to do so it doesn't Mm -hmm. feel like the power is totalitizing it's just something that seems to be uh you know internalized yeah naturalized yeah ah naturalization (laughs) what a concept that one is yeah yeah well it's just no, no, that's that's a whole nother thing. No, that's a tangent. <laughs> we'll be here that's for like an for hour and a half. Day. Another day. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. Did you have other directions you wanted to go to? I feel like there was something else that I wanted to bring up. Well, I also, perhaps if we wanted to bring up also um, Coil in, in this sort of like in-between state um, mm-hmm. where he he doesn't he doesn't place the the like, you know, action on the subject but he also doesn't force them to do what he wants them to do. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes he sets himself up in opposition or he like gives placation or this sort of thing. Um, like with Taylor, he, I, I, for both, he does both of them. I, I would say where like in the villain meeting, he sets it up uh, where he kind of forces her to act um, because he doesn't, or because he doesn't acknowledge her, um, the undersiders and the travelers. So they kind of have to like do their own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, earlier i think is when when she sort of like goes up and speaks to him about dinah and he really only agrees in this sort of you know placating moment um because he's he's not really like he he isn't thinking about what they can all like the benefit of using them like for long-term purposes he's just he's setting up a but of a bunch of like expendable individuals or he's Mm -hmm. like making them expendable by creating like this dependency Mm -hmm. upon him but yeah yeah because then he gets to choose their value Mm -hmm. yeah yeah because because all of his like all of his like um like material aspects not the not the like rhetoric of it but the the material is is both like material for himself but then also are like conditions and also like body oriented um but it all goes back to like little pieces where he like Mm -hmm. where he like gives a little instruction or like a little information it's not about you know they 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 each like take the sort of like step by step so it's like even more controlled i would say um because they're not the ones like that are taking the actions Mm -hmm. i don't know he's he's sort of in the like in between yeah i think so too yeah but Hmm. i don't know all of this to say um there's a there's a multiple different like methods i think of control that are demonstrated here um, and I think the the most concerning, I think, is the parallel between Jack and Taylor. And Taylor, I mean, she's not intentionally, like, many believe she's not intentionally, like, cruel or anything. 
Well, I I think intention is such a complicated word yeah. because I think it is there is you know she she is trying to do this. I think it's just unconscious. Yeah, she wouldn't she wouldn't necessarily say that it is, but she does yeah. she does think about the actions of if I say this, they will do this. Yeah, unconsciously intentional is what yeah. I would yeah end up calling it. Yeah, I don't know because both of both all of them sort of like lead down. To um, in addition to, like, the language of it, they have this, like, added addition of violence and, like, the threat of violence. Mm-hmm. So that their rule is, is, I mean, even if it is, like, with her and her territory, like, she's established this kind of, like, I'll give you stuff if you, I'll, like, I'll keep you safe, all of this. Mm-hmm. But there's, like, still that, like, you know, element of unspoken. Yeah, um, there's the there's the threat that, like, she... She's not specifically trying to evoke. She's not specifically trying to evoke, I'm going to hurt you if you don't obey mm-hmm. me, other than, you know, if you, you know, are hurting people, yeah, you know, she, like, has or, that whole doing list crime, and right? Everything. She's like, if you're doing crime, I will hurt you. But I don't, I don't think, I don't know how aware she is of the feeling it is to every other civilian that, like, she'll hurt them if they don't obey her, yeah. too. Well, because the first scene that she has, like, when she steps out of the bugs and everything, and she's like, you know, announcing all of these rules and setting it up. Um, she she does have this sort of like back and forth with like a merchant, I think. Um, yeah. Which like gets really violent, which is like you know is this sort of like spectacle of violence um, that I mean it isn't it, he the merchant isn't isn't a civilian, but there is that like he is an individual that was in the crowd. He he is a um. Uh, rebel Mm -hmm. and you know anyone else is thinking of rebelling as well looks at that and sees what sees what happened yeah yeah i don't know her her kind of like evolving you know demonstrative powers i think are something to watch yeah definitely yeah Hmm. okay anything else on this exploration you want to talk Um, about i think that's it for now okay and I'm sure we'll return to this after a bit. Uh, you know, th- something that I think you you and me are both realizing is how it's kind of hard t- to have so many unique theorists because cause we're going to go through 12 um, mm-hmm. explorations. So we're going to necessarily kind of cover the same kind of people sometimes. So, yes, uh, I yes. mean, we'll always, you know, try to talk about a different topic at the very least, but it's kind of inevitable that we'll revisit the same people a couple of times. Very true. Especially because, like, a lot of theorists talk about a lot of different concepts. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So it's like you may be talking about the same theorist, but it, it could be, like, a totally different aspect. And they yeah. also do – there's so much overlapping because they, they talk to each other oh, yeah. and, like, they write about – like, you know, they're, they're in dialogue of, like, the past and then, like, their contemporaries. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, one one person will will write about you know Marx, who's been dead for you know sixty mm-hmm. years, and then someone's gonna write about uh, not not about Marx, but write about that other person's response to Marx, yeah, yeah. and so on and so on. Ah, uh, gotta love academia. So. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, before we get into my uh, exploration, we're gonna have our little interlude yes. uh, with a little game I called "How fucked up is that." So, uh, I love this, the title this is a, of this. a new bit. Thank you, thank you. Um, we're we're going to go. Uh, I have a, a couple of horrible mm-hmm. moments from these arcs, these seven arcs, and I will uh, give a quick uh, description of them. And I just need you, Clarence, to rate it on a five star scale of how fucked up is that? I'm very ready. All right. Your entire family is modified with plastic surgery to look permanently like the most hated and feared individuals on the planet. How fucked up is that? Mm. Two out of five. Two out of five. <laughs> wow, we're setting the scale very wide here. We are. I guess you're giving room for all the rest. Uh, for uh, horrible moment number two, being turned into a murder rat. Hmm. How fucked up is that? Probably like a three point five. Wow, we're going up a bit. Well, it's like that's a whole. I mean, before star it's above. Like this, you know, it's like you're still a person, maybe kind of, mm-hmm. but then like murder rat, much worse. You know, now you're a rodent. <laughs> yeah, not only are you mixed with your someone, someone you hated, um, one way or another, you're also not in control of your body, yeah, which is terrifying. At that point, why and is there even so a brain? Much that why happen? Like, there's so many recurring moments yeah. of that of like not being con- mm-hmm. in control of your body. Um, oh yeah, terrifying. 
Bonesaw loves making people not in control of their body. Oh, All right. Uh, uh, going to a party, getting drugged, and fighting in an arena that only ends when someone gains a power that deletes chunks of flesh out of existence, and then not even getting the power you promised when you got in it. How fucked up is that? Mm, I'm going to say about 3.75. Wow, so that's that's even higher. I actually would have expected that to go lower. But there was than, just than there was so rat. much death that happened. It was so it was like, casual. Pretty horrible. Yeah. And by your, your fellow man, too. Yeah, yeah. Like, one of them, he's like... You didn't protect me, so like, mm, too bad. It was pretty. It was yeah. pretty. I, like when they first get in there, there's like two loners that back up together. They agree to work together, and as soon as oh, one turns his back, the other one clubs him over the head. Horrible. Yeah, can't trust no one. <sighs> All right. Uh, next up, we have a Siberian arm kebab. How fucked up is that? Hmm. Hmm. I mean, are are the people still alive when they are like? I'm gonna say one is. She had two people impaled on her arm, hmm. and then she, like, casually tosses them aside. I'm assume that at least one is. Then I'm going to say three. Three. Yes. So less than Murder Rat, less than Arena, but more than... More than your ...being murder- modified by plastic surgery to look like one of the nine. Yes. You have a <laughs> interesting method of I rating. don't... It's, you know... All right, next we have being essentially crucified, your organs removed to be outside of your body, and additional nerves extending around the floor of a freezer that is slightly too warm, and then being forced to watch as your friends debate whether or not to off you before they are drugged one by one and their brains sawed in two. How fucked up is that? I'm going to say four. Four. Okay, now I, I can follow this this yes. escalation yes. here. Oh, Brian. Pretty, that's, that's pretty horrible. It is pretty horrible. Like, I, I what do you think is the worst the, element like, of that? I feel like... The situ- like with hit like I feel like it's the exposed like nerves and body mm-hmm. where you like I don't I don't know just the like medicine is a good thing you know but mm-hmm. hospitals and you know surgeries terrify me sure and, like the concept of like waking up in the middle of a surgery is oh, something yeah. that without being able to control your body me. or tell anyone yeah. yeah well I also like I really don't like. That whole experience of, like, when you wake up, but you're not fully woken up and your body still has that, like, that particular enzyme. I don't know. The sciencey term, whatever. Sleep, you know, where you're, like, you're stuck. paralysis is what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Horrifying. Horrifying. Indeed. I agree. Yeah. And that's got to be, like, so much pain. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh. oh, man. Yeah. Uh, next up on, uh, on our list of horrible moments, we have Jack Slash pointing a knife at you and then saying the phrase, snicker snack, you and the baby die. How fucked up is that? Hmm. I just love the phrase snicker snack. I just needed a, a, a reason to say I really, it. It's so I good. Mean, uh, I have so much in the middle. I feel like it's like a 2.8. 2.8. You know, I'm, I might agree with it because it's at least at least you're dead. <laughs> I mean, snicker snack uh, is, is you know? rather quick, isn't it? Yeah, I feel like it. I feel like that's an implication. I mean, when Jack Slash says "sticker snack," I feel like it's that's quick. But like, if Siberian yeah. spoke and said "sticker snack," I feel like it would be a long time. <laughs> it would just be like you sitting there as as Siberian, like munched through your body. Uh, yeah, you know I mean? yeah, I think so too. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, that's in my head now. <laughs> You're welcome. Jesus. For a last entry in this game, uh, your sister using her brain power on you to make you love her, getting splashed with a flesh-eating acid so she has to touch you to heal you, and then getting turned into a coffin of flesh made of dogs and cats with your brain still not fixed. Uh, How fucked up is that? I feel like that's about a 4.5. 4.5. So we haven't quite maxed out the scale. You're leaving a little room here for a, a future entry because, of course, this is an escalating story here. We're only 15 arcs in. 14 arcs in. So... About halfway-ish, not really. Oh. oh. Leaving room here. Yeah, I, I, I'm But a 4.5 is, is the highest one on the scale here. Wait, say it again, sorry. So uh, a 4.5 is, is, is pretty fucked pretty fucked up here. It is. Pretty high it on the is. scale. Well, I mean, that's that's pretty, like, a lot to handle. That's a lot to handle. Mm-hmm. It is a lot to handle. However, I mean, if you're currently loving her, if you're in the moment, like, like you know, get in Victoria's brain for a second... It's probably not that bad. I guess. I mean, does she know that it's happened? Yeah, that's happened? the question, isn't it? Because I think that would change I don't know. this situation. It... If she doesn't know that she has been influenced and this just seems like her reality has always been this case, then I think that's still fucked up, but not it... quite as much as being it's aware of it. It's even more 
I think it's even more fucked up from an outside perspective, yes. but from inside an inside perspective, perspective it's less. less. Outside, much yes. worse. Yes. Uh, although I think before she's turned into a blob, um, or before she's turned into a coffin, she is aware. But I think while the coffin thing is happening, I think she's like hypnotized. So Ooh. I think she's not like totally conscious okay. at this point. But still, like, that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. Ugh. Oh, man. All right. Goodness. So uh, it looks like here, Panacea wins uh, this round of How Fucked Up <laughs> yeah. Is That? She did the most fucked up thing in these arcs. Oh, gosh. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. Oof. So that's what we have for the segment. Mm. All right. Um, I guess let's go into Hurrah. mine. Derrida. So, Derrida. Okay. So uh, this this exploration... Um, I was thinking a while how to do this. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about deconstruction mostly because I think it's something that you can definitely keep an eye on uh, with Worm. And because a lot of people's understandings of deconstruction is not the like literary analysis, like original theory version, Mm -hmm. which is, I mean, it's totally valid because, you know, if you're talking with other people with the same, you know, definition in mind, you're still, you know, you're you're talking about this thing. But when we use it on this show, it's probably good to, to know what it means. Um, the thing is, so deconstruction is a, if not post-structuralist, it's at like at the end of structuralism. Um, mm. And so you kind of have to know a bit about structuralism to really un- understand it fully. And um, so originally I thought, okay, so I'll make this segment about structuralism, except structuralism is like <laughs> so hard <laughs> to do. So I really do want to do it. So uh, my my goal here is I'm gonna try to explain um, structuralism, the the main key points here, and then get into Derrida and very quickly outline what you would do with it here. Um, and I feel like it's it's I'm a not, good one to just sort of like open up. And yeah, like... and it's it's just a really good I think example of like what kinds of stuff more of the post structuralist stuff is is going yeah, into. Yeah, uh, where it's more a little bit more mind bendy, a little bit more of a reality warping kind of view of the world. Yeah. Um, okay, let's 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 get into it and I'll explain as as we, we go. go. So this is going to be like 70% lecture and then 30% talking about worm probably. So, uh, before I can get to what deconstruction actually is, I want to explain what's kind of the philosophy behind it and to get to that, we have to talk about structuralism. Mm-hmm. So, uh the invention of English criticism and, and literary analysis is in, is and has been an ongoing process. The first time it became like really like a serious endeavor was uh, basically I think in the early twentieth century, like nineteen twenty something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, there were various groups of critics that are like trying to justify why there's an English department and kind of figure out why are we studying poetry? What what is the the point of this? And um, so I think I mentioned this already in the last Perspectives episode, but that was um, with the the new critics and the, the formalists that basically, you know, come up with these concepts like looking specifically at, at the text, not looking at, you know, biographies of the author, looking specifically what is inside the text and what is the text specifically trying yeah. to say. It was right? very, like, contained. The author, yeah. It was mm-hmm. very contained. Very contained, yeah. So they were trying to make it more into a science, mm-hmm. right? But they still had a lot of room for, like, interpretation. They still did believe that there's interpretation in this. Uh, so they were trying to do it like a science. The structuralists, which which come, um, they start around the same time, but it grows as a movement up until, like, the 60s, where Derrida and other people come in to kind of really harshly criticize mm-hmm. it. Um but it's even more of a science. So th- they're basing a lot of their findings on and, and a lot of their theories on Saussure, who is basically the founder of modern uh, linguistics and semiotics. Ah. So let's let's real quick explain semiotics hey, because that's semiotics. kind of the key point I'm, I'm getting to. Yes, it actually is a little bit of fun. So um, Saussure was basically trying to find out how we can actually scientifically talk about the systems behind language. So he basically divided language into, into two parts. Um, parole, which is talk, which is what people are actually saying. He's not interested in that at all. He's like, what the actual 
things that people mean, he doesn't care about that. He wants to talk about what he calls long, which is the system behind it, what the, the system that governs what we say at a given yeah, moment. Yeah. So each sign, which you can kind of think of a sign as a word and its meaning. So a sign is divided into two parts, the signifier, uh, which is like the sound or the, the text, mm-hmm. right? And the signified, which is the actual thing. So the signifier would be cat, right? Saying the word cat or the letter C-A-T. And the signified would be an actual cat. So, um, and you guys can probably already tell how difficult it is to talk about language within language because I'm just saying the same thing over and over again, but I mean different things. It's so hard. (laughs) Um, Yeah. (laughs) So, um, yeah. So so Sashur was basically... uh, his point is that language is, is basically a system of of signs, and uh, there's a couple important uh, notes here. Is that a sign, uh, a signifier has no real connection to its signified. Mm-hmm. It's completely arbitrary. There's no reason the sound cat should symbolize the animal a cat, right? Rather than any other animal or any other object or any other concept in existence. And so. The, the question arises of where does meaning come from? So, so Shore was talking about and emphasizing that uh, meaning for a sign comes from what the sign isn't. Mm-hmm. So a cat means cat because the word cat is not mat. It's not bat and it doesn't mean these things. So it comes from uh, the difference from other yeah. words. And it's like this not, socially produced mm-hmm. or like socially agreed upon sort of thing. Yeah, it's entirely socially like constructed mm-hmm. And the, the important here thing is here that there is no, like, specific place where the meaning arises. Yeah. It's all based off of negatives. Yeah, yeah. And so we'll, we'll get back to that idea of negatives and no center of meaning in a second. It's <laughs> just like everything is a lot of empty vessels. Yes. And, and that's where the post-structuralists come in. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So. Uh, but the structuralists, you know, take that and they're trying to use that as a science and looking at... Um, language and writing as you know these signs and how they work together so a lot of structuralism is based off of um, binaries and relationships where meaning is not from meaning does not come from what a word actually is and what is what or what a you know piece of literature is actually Mm -hmm. saying literally meaning comes from the relationships between the concepts and kind of the, the the more primitive um, simplification of those meanings. So structures paid a lot of attention to form. They're actually, it's pretty useful if you're looking at a poem. Um, it's a little bit more difficult when you're looking at entire story. That's where you get into more uh, narratology and that's where like Joseph Campbell's like Hero of a Thousand Faces and the, you know, looking at story structure mm, is yeah. Yeah, a structuralist thing. Um, they place a lot of emphasis on archetypes. That's where uh, Fry, is it William? Isn't hmm? it Northrop? Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> Northrop Fry uh, talks about the like five types of stories, right? Which are like comedy, tragedy, um, and th- the others. Um, <laughs> and you know. basically, y- yeah. So basically, all all structuralism um, is about how we can simplify into like the deep structures behind a story and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And the actual content does not matter, right? So if we were to analyze Worm using structuralism, it wouldn't matter anything about superheroes. It would matter what is where is the hero going? Are they going up yeah. or down? Are they uh, becoming more heroic or less heroic? Are they um, et cetera, et cetera. And it doesn't actually have to be out here. Yeah, we're like following the patterns to see how it fits into like the, the rest like the yeah. previous so, established. Yeah. 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 Um, every literary theory has kind of a different answer to the questions, what is the point of literature and why are we analyzing it? And what are we trying to get mm-hmm. out of it? Structuralism, its point is to reveal these deep structures to just get a better understanding of what those structures are and not necessarily get a you know specific theme out of it. It actually ignores all the literal themes. Um, a structuralist reading of Worm would not come up with any conclusion about um, bullying or what being a hero or villain means yeah, or anything yeah. like that. Um, that would not be the point. It very intentionally ignores those things. Where That's 
where it gets kind of really difficult to use and why I'm really reluctant to, to try to do it myself is it relies on you knowing a lot about all of the structures that exist, mm-hmm. right? All of these... Uh, yeah, there's so much background other... knowledge you have to have already mm-hmm. in place. Yeah, and it, they kind of... The structuralists kind of had this idea of the ideal reader that is completely unbiased and free from any ideology and also can identify... Yeah, they had like they had all these like specific meanings set up, like where you're like supposed to... Yeah. I don't know. It just... It, it, it doesn't really account for it, the audience, I think. Yeah. It, the ideal reader is is God, yeah, essentially, yeah. and you can't be perfect in that way. Um, yeah. So so to sum up, um, so from Eagleton, right? Eagleton, um, what's his first name? Terry? Oh, I keep forgetting. Yeah. Terry Eagleton's um, Introduction to uh, Literary Criticism. I think it's actually, the title's a little bit different like that. It's like Literary Criticism and Introduction, yeah, I think. like that. Anyway. Um, so he, he talks about structuralism, and here's a, a quick uh, summary of it. The new critics allowed that literature was in some significant sense cognitive, yielding a sort of knowledge of the world. Fry, a structuralist, insists that literature is an, quote, autonomous verbal structure, end quote, quite cut off from any reference beyond itself, a sealed and inward-looking realm which contains life and reality in a system of verbal relationships. All the system ever does is reshuffle its symbolic units in relation to each other, rather than in relation to any kind of reality outside it. Literature is not a way of knowing reality, but a kind of collective utopian dreaming which has gone on throughout history, an expression of those fundamental human desires which have given risen civilization itself, but which are never fully satisfied there. So, that's another thing. Um, Structuralists specifically viewed literature as only influenced by other literature, Mm. not influenced by reality. So, uh, yeah, so so that's that's the basic of, of of structuralism. It's it's pretty difficult to to perform, and it also has a bunch of problems. So I'm not super interested yeah. in it. So uh, structuralism is uh, based off of these relationships, and specifically the the kind of relationship that is the the most important, the most common is oppositional binaries, and this is what we're gonna talk a lot about. So mm-hmm. uh, basically, things are defined by what they're not, right? So that ends up being one thing is not another thing. And it's like one thing is the basis. The other thing is the yeah. not. And, but the first thing is also defined what, by it not being the other. Makes it really hard um, to like and, pin anything down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but one is always privileged over mm-hmm. the other. That original one is privileged. And again, uh, I'm going to emphasize this is saying that it's privileged. is not something that it's reflected in reality. It's how the language treats yeah, it, right? Yeah. So masculine is privileged over mm-hmm. feminine. Light is privileged over dark. Good versus evil. Hero versus villain. Bravery, cowardice, high, low, et cetera, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. Um, it gets a little bit complicated when there's stuff more like in the middle, like hot and cold. I don't know which one's the better one. Probably hot. It's, it's the higher yeah, one, yeah. but it, it gets better. It's not really the term, but yeah, privileged. Um, so a culture's values are made up of these binaries and how they feel about the binaries and what each of those terms are constituted of. So different cultures might have different sets of binaries. And of course, none of them are necessarily reflected in reality. Yeah. yeah. So this idea is fairly uh, platonic in, in the like Plato sense. Um, and I'm not I'm really not interested in, in going in and explaining Plato because I haven't done enough reading, but um, it, Plato and other ancient Greek philosophers, you know, were kind of the founders of, of Western thought. And so even though, you know, we don't think about them very much and a lot of us, you know, haven't read them, they do influence how we think of reality yeah, yeah. because, you know, other elites read them and pass it on to commoners and then it just perpetuates forward, et cetera. Um, but uh, Plato's uh, the, the, the Platonic world kind of asserts that um, reality is formed of like these these ideals, right? So like these oppositional binaries are a form of an yeah, ideal, yeah. even though like we might not grasp specifically what it should be. Like there is something that it should be. However, that leads us to post-structuralism and Derrida. Mm-hmm. So uh, a quick biography of Derrida. He's also an Algeri- Algerian-born French philosopher. He's he's white, though. Don't don't get it twisted. Mm. Um, his work is primarily being published in the late 60s to 90s, and he's in conversation with a lot of these other philosophers. Um, 
uh, at at the same time. And what the, what's going on right now is basically uh, faults are being pointed out in structuralism and just like the foundations of Western thought and just kind of this idea that we should kind of reinvent how we think of yeah, thought. Yeah. And um, that's this is where post-structuralism and post-modernism kind of rise. They, they're both tied together. They're not quite the same thing. It, neither has a super strict definition because they're both defined by what they're not. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but the end of this conversation at the time in the 70s where people are really questioning these bases and, he's, and he is specifically trying to figure out how to kind of reinvent uh, this, this, this school of thought after, you know, everything's kind of falling apart. So Derrida is looking at how, you know, we have these signifiers and, and signified, right? Um and he, he's noticing here basically that words don't contain their own meaning. Meaning is actually always outside of the yeah, word. Yeah. Uh, what does that mean? It's because a word by itself does not create enough concept uh, uh, context to explain what it is. Well, it's like, it's like um, that thing that I brought up um, about language where it's like all language is referential. Mm-hmm. So it like can't inherently hold meaning. Yeah. So uh, going back a bit, right, we were talking about how uh, everything's defined what, by what it's mm-hmm. not, right? So meaning is actually deferred to all those other words that it's not, yeah. right? And I mean, when you think about how how do you explain what a word means, right? You need more mm-hmm. words, right? If you if you look up a word in the dictionary, you get a bunch of words. And if you look up those words, you get more words. And so it goes on into this giant loop of a circle and it never really ends um the the platonic worldview and uh, some other philosophies basically and structuralists um basically try to hold on to this implicit idea even if they don't consciously think of, of it that somewhere there is a true meaning a true experience a true reality perhaps it lies it it has to like rely or it has to exist like outside of reality and not within the system because everything in the system uh, d- doesn't support mm-hmm. it, right? The 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 foundation has to be outside. So you know, uh, in in the Bible, right? You have like the Word, right? So God is an example of what where true meaning could yeah. exist, but also it could come from like matter or whatever we think of physical mm-hmm. reality. But the post structuralists basically hold that n- no, there is no true meaning. Yeah. anywhere it's a it's a giant giant loop um this this structuralist idea of a, of a stable system falls apart because there is no stable ground to anchor the system every sign can change and every change affects the other signs it's, yeah you, you, on there's nowhere on. you can stop yeah um so uh, i have another quote here from eelton um and I, i'm going a little long i i realize oh, no, it's um, all right. I'll, I'll try to get to the point i think Uh, Eagleton says, uh, reading a text is more like tracing this process of constant flickering than it is like counting the beads on the necklace. There is also another sense in which we never quite close our fists over meaning, which arises from the fact that language is a temporal process. When I read a sentence, the meaning of it is always somehow suspended, somehow something deferred or still to come. One signifier relates me to another and to that another. Earlier meanings are modified by later ones, and although the sentence may come to an end, the process of language itself does not. There was always more meaning where that came from. So, yeah, we we never we can never get the full picture if we're using language because it's by its nature there's there are things there's information not yeah, present. Yeah, it's like always an approximation. Yeah. Um so this I, idea that Derrida is outlining is is similar to postmodernism. Uh this uh, postmodernism kind of focuses on this idea that everything is a text and worthy of analysis. Mm-hmm. Um Modernism basically holds on to uh, that that some things are like basically objectively good, but then postmodernism's like, what 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 are you founding that objectiveness yeah, on? Yeah. Who's um, who's objectiveness? And, and is this? To, hmm? Who's objectiveness? Who has determined that? Yeah. 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 So, uh, like, I mean, just just for example of you know everything being a text, that means that everything can be you know, analyzed like, like a text because everything affects people like a text. And, and you can just follow a line of thought of like, you know, um, you can analyze a book, mm-hmm. right? 
as a text. You can analyze a movie as a text. You could probably analyze the trailer of a movie as yeah. a text. You could probably analyze a shirt with, you know, a picture of the movie as a text. Like, what is that saying? You could probably analyze a plain t-shirt as a text. What does that say about the person yeah. wearing it? And when it's on the shelf, what does the shelf say, right? Yeah, there's just there's Et just so much, like, all of our material, you know, surroundings and, like, the space and, like, our occupation of, of place and all. Like, it just, there's just so, like, you could just go down a rabbit hole of of yeah. everything. Yeah. All of this kind of, like, everything is like an archive of, of the past. Yeah. 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 Everything affects everything yeah. Yeah. in some way. Yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, this this idea uh, talks about how we should analyze everything's worthy of analysis, not just arbitrarily canonized mm-hmm. classics. Okay, so that's a lot of it's stuff. Quite, it's quite um, a lot. I've talked a lot, and I haven't even used the word deconstruction <laughs> yet. So what is deconstruction? So deconstruction is, and Derrida would disagree with the word method, but a method or operation it's it's interesting he specifically said it's not analysis it's not a critique mm-hmm. it's not a method it's not an operation basically because if it is any of those things it can't work to dismantle the system because then it's part of the yeah, system yeah. so it can't be an is of anything right it has it can only be mm-hmm. nots which is frustrating to talk about it so i'm going to use is as anyway <laughs> Um, anyway, an operation where you look at a text, ideally a foundational text for a culture or thought, right? So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get to, to why it's difficult to apply the worm in a second, but you could very, de- deconstruction, Derrida uses it on, um, you know, Plato's, uh, text itself, right? It's a foundational for Western thought, right? Mm, yes. Or, um, the Bible or, you know, any other holy text or, you know, any other philosopher's kind of stuff or, any book that is trying hard to push a certain ideology or way of thinking, right? So, I mean, looking at Ayn Rand's stuff is probably a good idea um, with deconstruction. Um, So uh, what you do is you identify an oppositional binary and then basically seek to destabilize it. In practice, what Derrida did is grab hold of one particular tiny section. I'm talking like one mm-hmm. sentence of the text and then run it through the entire text to expose how um, a certain uh, a binary that the text implicitly upholds and, and glorifies or says is correct betrays yeah, itself. Yeah. So um, Eagleton says it better than I can. I'm probably just going to rephrase it. So structuralism was generally satisfied if it could carve up a text into binary oppositions, high, low, light, dark, nature, culture, and so on, and expose the logic of their working. Deconstruction tries to show how such oppositions, in order to hold themselves in place, are sometimes betrayed into inverting or collapsing themselves, or need to banish to the text's margins certain niggling details which can be made to return and plague them. Derrida's own typical habit of reading is to seize on some apparently peripheral fragment in the work, a footnote, recurrent minor team, or term, or image, and work it tenaciously through to the point where it threatens to dismantle the oppositions which govern the text as a whole. The tactic of deconstructive criticism is to show how texts come to embarrass their own ruling systems of logic. Deconstruction shows this by fastening on the symptomatic points, the aporia or impasses of meaning, where texts get into trouble, come unstuck, or offer to contradict themselves. So uh, Derrida held that language and just human thinking in general, because it's all tainted by language, Mm. are full of uh, aporia. So aporia are basically these points where logic clashes with into itself into an impossible problem. So these unanswerable questions that humans can never figure out because their premises are conflicting. Right. The, The 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 two sides of a of what something is not are completely contradictory. Mm-hmm. So like what is love? What is justice? Right. Um, what is meaning of life, et cetera. They're aporia because they're, they're bases. Once you, you know, strip away everything else, just contradict each other completely and you cannot resolve yeah, them yeah. ever. You can get closer to an understanding, but because meaning is defined by what it is not, we can never reach what it is. Uh, it makes everything seem really feel like uh, smoke. You know, slipping through yeah. your fingers. Yeah. And like, and I feel like it gets worse too when you start thinking about like matter and like how empty matter really is. I don't know. It just yeah, it really like it's so easy for everything to kind of 
fall into a part. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of, yeah. It makes you worry about just the, the nature of reality because there is, there's no staple ground yeah. anywhere. So um, I've talked a lot about definitions. Let's, let's start looking at mm-hmm. worm. Um, I need a little, a, another second here to, to start to figure out how we apply to worm because, um, so deconstruction is a critical method, right? It's, it's a way to criticize typically a mm-hmm. piece, right? So how you apply to worm and that's where it, it gets a little complicated, if we were used to deconstruct, if we were to use deconstruction directly, we would grab a non-specific, non-central line in Worm, and use it to show how the text falls apart. But I think doing that wouldn't really work or be fair to Worm. It or it would work, but it'd be kind of difficult because a Worm is not trying to put forward slash argue for a specific way of thinking. It's more of a critical yeah, piece, yeah. right? And B, Worm is told from Taylor's perspective, which is an intentionally skewed or incorrect one. Um, or she's an unreliable narrator. So we'd be dis- deconstructing an unreliable narration. Yeah, yeah. it's something right? that's like already kind of wobbly. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's intentionally constructed to mm-hmm. fall apart. And, and additionally, deconstruction is destructive to the authority of a text, right? It's to show how the text yeah, is wrong. Yeah. And it you know, feels unfair to do that on something that is definitely not spawned ways of thought. You, like, I mean, it's not influential enough to, to do that. I think, you know, it'd be fair to do that to Harry Potter. Oh, sure, that should definitely but happen. Yeah. Especially because Worm hasn't, it, it hasn't gone through a publishing process where like the ending influences the beginning, yeah, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, it um, functions differently. Yeah. So what's the other angle to use deconstruction? Um, well, I'm sure you guys have heard that Watchmen is a deconstruction. You've heard it described that way. And you've maybe seen that term on TV tropes and stuff. So the idea goes that since everything is a text and everything can be a critique, Watchmen, and I'm going to say Worm 2, is deconstructing concept or concepts or other media in society by seizing on those peripheral ideas, running them through to logical conclusions and other parts of the text that is society until they destabilize or dismantle the very placement of those op- oppositional mm-hmm. binaries. So this understanding is a little bit different from the TV tropes understanding, which focuses on the idea that the deconstruction will point out that tropes aren't realistic by making them the focus of the reality, which, again, that understanding of deconstruction is totally valid. Um, it's just different from uh, Derridian deconstruction, just a little bit, because Derridian dis- deconstruction is focused on those binaries inherent in the culture, while the other understanding is focused on tropes. Um, speaking of, if you want to see a great discussion of that um, de- definition of deconstruction, you can watch uh, Jay Maniac's video on YouTube talking about if Worm is a deconstruction or reconstruction, and I f- found the video delightful, so please go watch that. Oh, um, so finally, I've so I've defined all the stuff. It only took 40 <laughs> minutes. Uh, let's ask, what is Worm deconstructing? What are the binaries it's destabilizing? And what are those peripheries it's latching onto? Um, and so I, I, I don't want to dive too deep into all the applications of this right now. I think this is something that's just good to define. So in the future, we can look at this because you know the idea of deconstruction is you run it through the entire you know the entire text and so it helps a lot to have more of the text available yeah. to us i feel like this would be a good thing to like um, so turn just, to at the very end yeah I, yeah i think that's going to be useful mm-hmm. in the future so i'm going to just identify a couple um and i i think we won't probably do whole episodes again on deconstruction but i think we'll we'll bring yeah, it up yeah. again um so so what here what are some some binaries um what comes to mind are some of those that um taylor and uh, other characters identify other people Mm -hmm. as right so taylor identifies people as bully versus victim right um sophia identifies people on um predator Mm -hmm. and prey and there's of course of course there's the binaries of good and evil right and wrong hero and villain um i think there's others like justified and unjustified which i have another point on um so I think uh, it, Worm is obviously doing a lot of things. I think specifically, one thing it's doing is deconstruction, deconstructing utilitarianism, um, running 
the conclusion of the ends justifying the means through basically a bunch of trolley problems. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like Taylor making Sundancer having have to burn civilians to mm-hmm. get the nine. Um, and and Taylor is a proponent of a kind of proponent of utilitarianism. Um, it, actually, so I have a I have a quote here, right, where she's talking to Sierra and Charlotte, um, and I'll just read it and then I have some okay. thoughts on it. So Taylor says, "I don't believe in shouldn't. Like there's some universal rules about the way things should be, the way people should act. Uh, I think this is Charlotte talking. So there's no right or wrong." People and animals should do whatever. No, there's always going to be consequences. Believe me when I say I know about that. But I do think there's always going to be extenuating circumstances where a lot of things we normally assume are wrong become excusable. Like rape? Are you going to tell me there's a situation where rape is okay? Charlotte asked. I would have thought I'd touched on a hot subject if her voice wasn't so level. I shook my head. No, I know some things are never excusable. So I... (laughs) As it said, I don't think it would be right to deconstruct Worm Mm -hmm. using this because the book intentionally shows how Taylor is at least somewhat off here. But this is kind of setting up one of those peripheral elements, right? Taylor is showing some utilitarian thinking here and then reveals this peripheral statement, quote, some things like rape are never excusable. And the idea can be run through this million word story and it starts challenging the very premises of right and wrong, justified and unjustified. Something can be justified even while it's unforgivable. Uh, like Regent's control of Shatterbird, mm-hmm. right? We've already kind of established how Regent's control is metaphorical, yeah, yeah. kind of like rape, mm-hmm. right? And they're they're doing it. We're not even halfway through the story. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I feel like Taylor especially, yeah. too, like kind of priori- prioritizes this sort of like, in, in the way that she like progresses through her like linear thinking. She does a lot mm-hmm. of this where she, she justifies things or she sort of like, you know, she finds those extenuating circumstances um, mm-hmm. and and sort of like rationalizes them. Yeah. 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 She, she inevitably, you know, almost intentionally runs into them and then runs yeah, past yeah. them. Yeah. Um, in addition to utilitarianism, she's also – or. Worm, I think, is also deconstructing other moral systems, right? The whole superheroic sense of mm-hmm. right and wrong, um, always doing the right thing. Um, legend and Panacea's notions of right and wrong intentionally fall apart in the story pretty quickly. Um, but there's there's plenty of other um, ways that this falls apart, right? You know, just beautiful and, and mm-hmm. ugly, right? Just the fact that, or I mean, it's probably another uh, other words that are... F- suit this better but the idea of just image in general and taylor you know controlling bugs while while being a hero right yeah the, the like traditional um, sense of like a good sort of power and like a you know an acceptable sort of power and, and not acceptable and the yeah. things that would be deemed villain or deemed hero like it it all sorts of because we have been placed in in this in the perspective of someone who does not align with that we mm-hmm we also see that sort of like falling apart. Yeah. Um, I mean, I actually, I have some more definitional stuff about deconstruction that I should mention. Mm-hmm. I, I couldn't find what text this came from, but I know that my professor who's teaching this talked about this. Um, so he was talking about, you know, how deconstruction is, is applied and there, there's, there's multiple steps mm-hmm. to it. And, I'm really hoping I have the, the the order of the steps correct, but basically, the the first step right is where you're showing how the binary is not as absolute as it is, yeah, right? Yeah. So I, this this is one that Worm is especially doing, um, where you know hero and villain the lines are are pretty blurred. And in, in another context, it would be like how man and woman are not like there's there's stuff in between. There's uh, they're they're not nearly as absolute, mm-hmm. right? And because binaries are oppositional the closer and the more in-betweens you have uh, the closer and more in-betweens you have the more the the less meaning that those words have so like hero has to define itself against yeah, villain yeah. so the more heroic the villains are the less significant the term hero mm-hmm. means and it's the same thing if they become more villainous uh same thing with with good and evil um especially when you add in another level of the binary, right? You have hero and villain, and then you have serial mass murderer villain. Yeah. yeah. And suddenly the villains don't look so the, villainous. Like, wider range, it gets so much more 
so much so much less defined like all the ca- like the categories really start to like yeah. lose any sort of traction yeah the the second step um is basically reversing the the binary where one side was was normally privileged now you privilege mm-hmm. the other side you show how women are more essential than men or how villains are more useful and heroic yeah. than heroes yeah um and then there's a the third step where you kind of dissolve it entirely but i'm not entirely sure i i think that's a, we're at the point where you get to those impossible meanings yeah. and you, you show how the entire binary in the first place cannot mm-hmm. exist really um so uh, that's that's what I've got, I think. <laughs> that's quite a lot. Yes, yes. I hope that wasn't too anything for people listening, too, too boring, too much, too complicated. Yeah. Too... It's really hard to tell what it, while I'm talking. I, maybe it was super, super simple. And people are like, Matthias, you're, you're being condescending by assuming that it was difficult. So, But there's so many like, little Could intricacies be. of it. At the very least, I can safely say that I kind of am almost starting to understand yeah. it. So... Uh, I, I don't claim full uh, understanding of, of this quite yeah. yet. So I think it's it's one of those things where it's like, like it, it should be simple because like we're talking about mm-hmm. language and we're talking about how language functions and all of this, you know? And so yeah. it feels like it should be simple. But then when you really like when you actually start looking at it and like the way that it functions and the way that we use it and the way the, the so many things that we choose not to acknowledge... When examining, you are forced to acknowledge all of those kind of like the like unstableness, unst- like the instability, I guess, of 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 mm-hmm. every like of every interaction that we have because of the use of language, and it just it gets so complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really hard to talk about the system from within yes. the system. So, and and, and that's the, but then we can't like we can't think outside of it because it's like yeah, what is thought that isn't bound by language? You know, yeah. Huh. Yes. If you if you can't leave the box, how can you think exactly. outside it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what I have on Derrida. Um, if you guys are further confused, feel free to send <laughs> us an email and I'll try my best to explain or try to understand it better myself. Uh, but before before we uh, end, we have two, two more bits, right? We're going to talk about favorite mm. powers, then our themes and theories, and then we will do our yeah. outro. So... Uh, <laughs> Let's let's finish off with with some more lighthearted Yay. stuff. Uh, Clarence, what was your favorite power from these arcs? Alrighty, okay. I guess this isn't like a lighthearted thing, though. Um, I was just. I mean, mine isn't um, either. So with with Legends power specifically, Legends Flight. I know I went like really into detail about like how terrified I was of space, so I'm not like uh-huh. super excited about the space part of it. But the concept of shutting mm-hmm. down thought like just like the the like the that that just sounds so like mentally soothing to like not have to think it, when it moving does so sound fast like med- meditation yeah just I, I really like that bit the not thinking bit yeah so yeah when he goes the, the faster he goes the more the, the mm-hmm. less he thinks yeah, yeah. It, what's what i find really reassuring i i think that idea to me could be really scary the idea of like you eventually go so fast that you can't ever think the thought that you want yeah. to stop and so you just hurdle on forever but i think he specifically says it like when he gets to the destination he would start thinking yeah, again yeah. that he would automatically stop yeah so it just it's comforting nice. mm-hmm. he's he's made of light too yeah. you know he he goes into that other form and just takes in some light and then heals ah, which is crazy legend. to me what a legend so iconic i already made that joke <laughs> Alrighty. Um, what about okay. yours? Uh, uh, I I want to talk about Crawler's power. I think it's just so mm-hmm. interesting. I want a a story not necessarily set in in parahumans world, but a any a story anywhere about someone with this horrible horrible yeah. power, uh, where he just gets more and more mutated mm-hmm. over time based on harm, intentionally placing himself in harm's way. Like just just I just want to see the first week. Where he got his yeah, power, yeah. right? He got it, and he probably like just got a knife and just stabbed himself for like an hour. Like, what's our, it's, it's just such a such a self destructive mentality. Yeah, but like I, I your mean, body th- feeds. It, it eventually it. gets him. It's it's so it is so self self destructive that it actually like even if it's supposed to be self destructive in a self perpetuating yeah. sense, right? Where 
it, he just can can escalate more and more over time. But it, his his need to hurt himself is what kills mm. him at the end. It it's not any other you know subversion. It's just eventually he just bit off more than yeah. he could chew. Yeah. I also have to wonder what situation makes you adapt to spit acid as a self defense. Mm. That's pretty. I don't know. Yeah. Terrible situation. And I also wonder what are the other paths he could have yeah. gone down, right? Because he didn't necessarily have to turn into a bus sized like twelve legged. Yeah, there's so many. There's so many. I don't things actually know that he if he has twelve legs. Like, pursued. Yeah, and he can still still talk. Oh yeah. Which is creepy. That is. I don't. I feel like I didn't pay attention very much when he talked because I I I it was spent deep like and more rumbly. more time noticing other people thinking about him. Mm-hmm. Oh, so strange. Super creepy. Very creepy. Okay, that's our favorite powers for this week. Uh, let's get into our themes and theories. So we basically have two, two things to, to mention here, right? So uh, themes and theories for future episodes, guys. Um, basically, uh, as as we described, we're basically like headcanons for characters, for, for um, theories. Um, so, you know, possible explanations for why characters are the way they are that are not influenced by other stuff later on in the... Well, it can be influenced by, but they can't be pulled out it, don't don't just say you know a fact that comes out in arc 23 or whatever um f- for us um and, and ideally not influenced by word of god either or word not you know what i mean um yeah uh extra textual stuff that oh, Wado okay. has said yes i was like is this um, like some telephone call that you'll yeah, get not not literally not literally word gotcha. words okay. from god uh and then themes so what kinds of themes do you guys think are you know, worthy of examination mm-hmm. in the story. I, you know, sacrifice was mentioned last time, and I thought that was really men- really relevant. And maybe we should have focused on it more this time as well. Yeah, but, we need oh, well. like we need to make Next it, like, time. a list. Yes, we yes, I will probably do that probably. <laughs> so uh, Vladislav says uh, rules and limitations. Um, they say, I think this book heavily dives deep into in- inspecting what boundaries are set for people and which of them they set themselves. With a number of characters limited by outside forces, dragon, shadow stalker, etc., and by their own rules, panacea, spitfire, etc., they are contrasted against truly unbound for morality. From they are trans- contrasted against the truly unbound for morality slaughterhouse mm-hmm. nine, and they are in turn contrasted by increasingly ruthless Taylor and the heroes of Brockton Bay. Oh, that's a really good point. Of like, there are there are a lot like there definitely are like limitation. Yeah, I didn't think about like dragon and shadow stalker together. Because they both have this sort of, like, mm-hmm. imposed outside force. Yeah, th- there's 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 a lot of, like, themes of, like, controlling other people's behavior and, like, actions. Oh, yeah. Um, very materially. Um, mm-hmm. Of, like, creating, like... I didn't bring it up in my, you know... What do we call them? Explorations? Um, mm-hmm. But the, like, the whole deal with the wards and all of that, which I definitely want to explore, but I'll do it later. Um, but, like, this sort of, like, governing of behavior... Is very like yeah, very much present. Yeah, it's it's interesting how, <laughs> for the good people, rules seem to hold them back from mm-hmm. doing good, and for the bad, rules don't work on them at all. Like panacea. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I feel like and and Shadow Stalker too. She totally flouts it. Yeah, so. it's they it it's they're limiting. I think when they feel pointless mm-hmm. um it's kind of like if you need rules they mm-hmm. don't work the dragon does not need rules yeah. i mean she needs some even though she doesn't like it but um she does she doesn't need them to you know be a good person and so they're more yeah limiting yeah but we're also i was thinking about this too when i was like expounding um on dragon <laughs> uh earlier about like we we have we really only have her perspective of the situation Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Um, so we're think like we're thinking definitely like that she needs to you know have have you know autonomy over herself and all of this. But I mean we don't know what she could do. So there's this yeah. whole like large question mark. I don't know. I mean she is an That's AI. True. That's true. She's not human. How how do mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. All right. Um, so additionally, um, I roll uh, expert eye roller posted on the last uh, perspective thread uh, with this really great examination of uh, a particular theories uh, theorists um, theories uh, ag- 
I think it's pronounced agamben, I'm not entirely sure, uh, as applied to worm. So to summarize, they theorist, were yeah. examining how... A Greek hmm? theorist? Um, I not. I don't think they were Greek themselves. I think they were building... Or I, I don't think they were an ancient Greek themselves. I think they're building mm, okay, off okay. of the ancient Greeks. Yeah, an Italian philosopher. Mm, okay. At what, what time period? Uh, Modern, I oh. think. There's a picture oh, okay. of him. Uh, he's 78 wow, now. So. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, Giorgio Agamben. So, um, looking at these uh, ancient Greek concepts of uh, the spheres of life. Mm-hmm. Um, so, to, but to summarize, uh, expert eye rollers points uh, were, were especially around uh, Taylor and Arms Master and how individuals are placed in and outside of the law and how the law can sort of ignore the actions of those against the people outside, placed outside the law. Um, they, they, they talk a lot more uh, and there's a lot to learn about how um, uh, expert eye roller summarizes these the, the, the positions of the theorists. I think it's uh, really worth a read um, and it's not even that yeah, long. Yeah, but it's like, really like in depth. 500 words. It's very yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. I, I really, I mean, it, it, it'll just take a mm-hmm. minute to read and I think it's pretty relevant and, you know, maybe maybe I'll we'll, we'll try to do something like that for a future episode because I don't have that many theories, uh, theorists in mind oh. left so um it, there's this really great line that um I, i'd like to point out pull out that i think is um something that we sort of talked about but um the end bringers uh, breaches into the legal system itself have already been normalized mm-hmm. right so uh, talking about how the you know how you you were talking about clarence um the abnormal bodies right the people outside yeah, yeah. um and how it, they're they're kind of pushed back into the norm. End bringers are not they're they're normalized. Yeah, they're like a that, built that going in, in and out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Which I thought was really really interesting. So, uh, yeah, go uh, please go read that. It's it's yeah, real quick and of course, so interesting. um, you, you know, send us send us your own themes and theories for the next thing, right? And maybe look at another theory yourself or something like that. You, I mean, you could even Google literary theorists and just start clicking around. Um, there's a lot of sites that are they fairly easy to navigate and can summarize different positions. Yeah. So, um, all right. So um, the day that this comes out is the uh, doof cast on Mad Max Fury Road. Uh, it's a Council of Doof episode, so everyone who listens to it can go and vote on it uh, to see if it belongs in the Doof canon. So I would say please go listen and vote yes because Fury Road mm-hmm. is amazing. Um, additionally, I, I just want to really talk about uh, I, I want to talk about Pale Road real quick. It's going awesome right now. I, I went on I, I started reading for like four chapters like after one point six something like that, and I'm really glad I jumped back in because I would say that the end of arc one is like Worms arc eight. It's the big Whoa. hook. Um, I mean, there might be a even better one later on. I, I don't know, but um, I, where I was like, I was excited for what was to come. Now I really need to know what's coming mm-hmm. next. You know, um, so this there's really interesting stuff going on. Um, actually, there's a really the way there's not no spoilers here, so I'll keep things vague. But the way that 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 last interlude, the the interlude of arc one is used, mm. like its purpose in the story is interesting and i think different from how interludes normally are used in wild bow works so please clarence you need to read it so i can talk (laughs) about it it's on my list yes um (laughs) anyway so uh and last but not least there's tons of uh stuff going on on the doof twitch channel i think it's worth mentioning Uh, elliot and his sisters are playing games together i think and uh he's also preparing for uh the new the new video series that's eventually going to go on um talking about uh video games and that's different from the game club and then scott is playing through a lot of i say a lot i think all of the final fantasy games so um is that like there's there's a lot of gaming stuff going on games or like a specific uh, the the Final Fantasy games are basically a mm, series okay. um, of sort of sequels. They they're they are all similar but not the same. Gotcha. Okay. It yeah, it's an interesting series. You've heard of Final Fantasy VII though, I'm pretty sure, with um, Cloud and Cloud. other characters. If you Googled it, I'm sure you I would mean, recognize the main I character. I have definitely heard the phrase Final Fantasy. Yeah, but that's all. Yes, yeah. cool. <laughs> cool. So, also, 
If you like what we do here at Doof Media, consider donating a single dollar per month or whatever else you can afford. Um, it's it's due to the generosity of our patrons that we're able to create shows like this one. Um, the patron dollars are what pays like our hosting fees and like how we're able to purchase like the microphone and all of these like material things that need to get done. It's very helpful. And there's like cool stuff. Like the like the patron mm-hmm. boards and everything. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, so you can go to uh, patreon.com slash doofmedia and see all the great patron rewards we have. Uh, as always, as we say all across the network, the best one uh, we all think believes um, starts at the $1 level, which is access to the Doof Discord, where so much uh, discussion goes on. Um, I, I've really enjoyed actually uh, reading the live reads from the, the, the pale discussion and then of course uh, everyone talking about th- this show and, and other you know the, it's it's so it's it's so interesting to see discussion prompt from something we say on the podcast and then it veer off into yeah, a different it's, direction it's so, I love it's that so, so much. fascinating to watch the like direction of yeah. the dialogue because mm-hmm. it, yeah. it can get like it, um, it, it's such ah sorry I I, I just you know yes. it's fascinating yeah, I mean you you and me we took a a, a class on how basically on how communities communicate yeah, with each yeah. other right and, and um i i didn't i ended up doing it basically over the threads the, the we've got mm-hmm. worm threads um because you know i only can think about one thing guys it's it's all encompassing um but i i had been tempted to do it on the discord just because it's just such an interesting it's, it's so interesting how every single platform and then every like group within that platform have like different yeah, cultures. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the other way you can help us if you, you know, don't have a uh, spare cash, which we totally understand um, is to leave a rating or a review or rating and a review. Um, we actually had our, our, our first review a while back at a, which I found so surprising um, that, that it was that it was so mm. early. So um, we're going to go ahead and read it out. Um, so Kyle at 30 says, Great recap. As someone who has read Worm fully through once but has not been able to revisit since, Matthias and Clarence take me back through Wild Bow's wonderful world one book at a time. Well, I would recommend listening to Scott and Matt's We've Got Worm for the first time reader for first time readers after each arc. Decomposing Worm is a great way to relive the world for those who have finished the story and are looking to revisit it again. They provide a knowledgeable summary of the, the story book by book. More excitingly, they release a deep dive literary analysis after each recap episode. I find myself eagerly awaiting every Friday to tune in with these great guys. Thanks for all the work you guys put into this, and I'm really loving it so far. Thanks so much, wow. Kyla. That's wow, that's, that's so, so much. Nice. That's so good. It's ah oh. wonderful, overwhelming. Yeah, that's ah oh, that makes me so happy. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so now, now Clarence and I have uh, stuff to pull out whenever we wow, feel bad. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Um, uh, lastly, um, I I keep forgetting to do this. Uh, I I, I want to apologize directly to Wildbow because I keep meaning to plug the Patreon and then I keep forgetting. So (laughs) I'm starting next time, starting next week. I'm putting it in the script. So I'm not going to, in fact, I'll do it right now. I'm I'm writing it down. I'm doing it all caps. Plug (laughs) Wildbow. Because Wildbow is the one that created this amazing work that uh, we we are, you know, spending so much time on and uh, we wouldn't, be doing this kind of analysis and i i probably wouldn't be so excited to do analysis if wildbo hadn't written this stuff and then scott and matt hadn't started doing mm-hmm. we've got worm so um please go to wildbo's patreon and consider donating him some in fact i would say consider donating to him before you consider donating to us <laughs> that would be <laughs> my personal uh consideration because yeah we wouldn't have all this incredible incredible content if it wasn't for him yeah. so you can uh if you want to reach us uh we have now a twitter right uh at oh, decomposing yeah, pod on on twitter that's right uh where um we're going to tweet out stuff that's where you would find the announcement that this episode is going to be a couple hours late because it is going to be a couple of hours late um uh, of course it should i hope it still comes out friday i think it will we'll see um or you can send us an email at uh decomposing podcast at gmail.com and of course going to the uh, reddit thread and talking about it there i think that's probably the best place but if you don't have a reddit account or you just want to reach us in a different way emailing us is a great way to do that Uh, next week is our overview episode for arcs 15 through 17 this is our smallest book only 222,000 words i think so i'm excited to get back on track and have an episode that's less than three hours long 
we'll yes. see. I think this might be less than three hours. I mean, it might be like exactly three hours. I mean, but you know, optimism. <laughs> optimism. Um, also, so we're uh, starting to take questions again then. So don't forget to uh, send us your questions for Clarence and your themes and theories for those arcs. Um, starting, you know, next... Never mind. I've explained it too many times and I get confused every time while I'm explaining it. But basically, if you send us your questions under the discussion thread for mm-hmm. this episode, we will respond to them in the next two episodes. Um, and even if you don't have any questions for Clarence or themes and theories, we'd love to hear what you guys thought of the episode. So. Yeah, we just, it's cool to like see everybody responding and thinking and, I don't know, sharing their experience it, all together. Th- it's so weird that this conversation exists outside of the moment in time where we're talking yeah. about it. <sighs> yeah. It's really weird. Conversation of mankind, you know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, that's all we have for y'all this week. Next week, we'll have our overview episode um, covering Arcs 15, Colony, 16, Monarch, and 17, Migration, which, yeah, there we go. I'm excited. <laughs>